Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Space Down Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate each and every one of you tuning us on in for another great night of high quality woo. That's what we do here. Katie Grabowski is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. She's the head of Colorado MUFON. She's got fantastic hair, too. And you know we like good hair around here. And we'll bring Katie on here momentarily. Before we do, let's give a rundown of everybody in our chat room. So far tonight, in the gold medal position, we have Race Fan. Jack Clark takes home the silver. The gorgeous Steph Dickey brings home the bronze. Gabe, how you doing? Sultry Susie. Mennonite Abe, what is up? The lovely and talented Julie Kay is here. She'll be signing autographs after the show. Please line up to the left of the studio, if you don't mind, to the left of the studio. Gorgeous Jennifer Lane, Grand Paul Holland, Jurassic Joey, good to see you all. Thank you for coming on in. Howard, Data Derivations, and John Swan, good to see you. Mama Susan, nice to have you back. So we scroll on down. SJ, what's going on? There she is, everyone. The lovely and talented Emily Bigelow, otherwise known as Alaska's greatest athlete. Drew Morris, good to see you. Space Cow, thanks for joining us. Nicola, thank you for taking the time, man. We really do appreciate it. And let's see. I know I'm, my chat room just jumped here. Hold on. Oh, let me uh, get back to where I'm supposed to be. All right, here we go. Uh, Stephen Edmond, nice to have you back, man. Uh, good to have you. Michael Smith, thank you so much for kicking off the Super Chat tonight. Really do appreciate that. Spookles the gorgeous cat. Spookles, by the way, will be signing autographs after the show. Line up to the right of the studio. To the right of the studio. Don't make eye contact either. She doesn't like that. All right, moving on down. Stephen Edmond, good to have you here. Apollo 11, nice to see you. Double Tim, great to have you back, my friend. And Bolenium, good to hear see you, man. Sean, nice to have you back. Mark Salzman, the lovely and talented Jamie Lynn Ricketts has returned. Uncle Dale and his power stash are here. If you're in Austin, Texas, and you see Uncle Dale, rub his power stash for 14 days of good luck. That's what you need to do. Hello, gorgeous science, Melinda. Nice to have you here. XBLXXR1FLEMANXX, whatever the hell that means, Rifleman. Nice to have you here. Welcome to our chat room. Ozzy Ozzy, oi oi to you. The gorgeous Michelle C is here. Solar Warden, Stewpot, good to have you guys here. Thank you for coming on in. Jello Budden, what's up? Ed Clater, how you doing? And there she is, everyone. The lovely and talented Jennifer P has returned. Microglobe, welcome to the channel, man. How you doing? Thanks for adding me on Facebook earlier on today. I really appreciated our little chat that we had. Dirty Filth, how you doing? Alan Hold, nice to see you. Dark Winter Wolf, welcome to the channel. Thank you for coming back. And let's see, who else do we got? Apollo 11, thank you so much for that awesome super chat, man. Uh, I really do appreciate that and your support of Spaced Out Radio. Thank you so much. All right, who else do we got here? Ufologist, the gorgeous Jessica McCreary has returned. Todd Hunter, Bassmaster, how you doing? And uh, the gorgeous wrench, Kira, is returning now. Look, she's got perfect hair tonight, perfect hair. All right, uh, the Wizard Grand, Philip Blair is here. The Philip Blair. Elliot D., good to see you. Smoking Joe, smoke him if you got him, buddy. Richard Elmore, good to have you here. Pac Woman, nice to see you on Twitch. Thank you for joining us. And uh, who else we got? Jason1331, good to see you. Lawrence, what's happening? Hexstar, good to see you. Open-minded clarity. Michael Lestuka, Big Bad Jim. Virgil's returned. Oh, wow, Virgil's here. Now we can officially start the show. And uh, let's see, who else has returned? Noble Patrick, good to see you. Mr. Man, Mr., the Triple M. Yes, we're, we're happy that you're here. All right, uh, let's see. I think we're uh, caught up. Rich Hilke's here, everyone. The Rich Hilke. All right, anybody want to see our guest's beautiful hair? There it is. <laughs> there it is. Oh. Katie Grabowski. Hey, Chefist, what's going on? How's your mustache? Please let us know. Vince Proto, good to have you here. Chad Smith, I'm Chad Smith. I'm Chad Smith. Rocket Niner, what's happening? Irish Lincoln, good to see you. The gorgeous Jenny, thanks for coming on in. All right, a good way to support this show, everyone, is through the Super Chat. Thank you to Michael and Apollo for kicking that off. Also, a great way to support what we do on a nightly basis here 
on Spaced Out Radio is, if you're new, hit that subscribe button, ring that bell. We are literally live here seven days a week on our YouTube channel. So make sure you check us on out. We really appreciate that. We're going to get going here in about seven seconds. We are going to rock and roll your pants off talking ET and everything tonight. Here we go. From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Oh, we got a great one for you tonight. Katie Grabowski is Colorado MUFON State Director and serves on the Colorado Board of Directors. She is a star researcher, part of the SAT team investigations for MUFON. She is team lead administrator for MUFON's Mars team. Apparently she's going to Mars, but with two R's, not one. She also conducts her own independent investigations and research outside of MUFON and likes to present her findings. She spends a lot of time traveling to archives for research and to conduct interviews. She is the author of Letters of Love and Light, Four Decades of UFO Encounters, Experiences, and Sightings Shared with Ufologist R. Leo Sprinko, Ph.D. She also holds a Bachelor of Science in Visual Communications and owned her own graphic design studio, Design Junkie. Katie's website is katiegraboski.com. Katie, I've wanted to do this interview with you for a couple of years. Probably didn't even know who the heck I was. And you know what? But you know what? We snuck you in. We 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 baited the hook. You bit. Damn it. We set the hook. And now you're here. Thank you so much for coming on Spaced Out Radio. What a pleasure it is for us to have you here. Oh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. I would have come sooner. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll blame the booking people for that. No, I'm teasing. They do a great job around here. Katie, for a lot of people who may not know who you are, how did you get involved with UFOs? Well, you know, from early on, um, I was born in Illinois, and um, my grandparents lived in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. And so when I was really young, we had two sightings. My gra grandfather had a sighting over Lake Como in Wisconsin that I heard about as a young girl. And then my family and I, um, in Richmond, Illinois, going back from my grandparents' house, had a couple close encounter sightings of an oblong craft. Um, we moved out to Colorado in 1970, um, you know, kind of put all that on the back burner, but from 1975 to 1978 out um, on a ranch in Elbert County, uh, my sister and I and our family experienced some really high strangeness events. But, you know, like most people, uh, I focused on my family and career. I raised five kids and went to school, got my degree, and I uh, didn't start revisiting these strange things that happened to me till 2012. So I joined MUFON as a field investigator right out of the box in 2012 to kind of try to find answers to what had happened to me all those years ago. Did you ever think that this was where your life would take you, chasing UFOs? Not at all. <laughs> no, no. And I, I kind of had, uh, you know, a lot of paranormal events happen to me as well. So actually in like 29, I really started getting into the ghost hunters and watching, you know, Grant and Jason and went out to the St. Augustine Lighthouse and did the Stanley Hotel and kind of was really looking to what, you know, what are these shadow figures in our room? And, you know, what, what is all this paranormal stuff that's happening? So I kind of started there and then I'm like, you know what, what was all that stuff on the ranch? And that led me to the UFO side of things. And once you jump in that rabbit hole, oh my gosh, you never really get out of it. And I think it's fair to say, you know, my husband knows, like ask me, 
it took me years to become even a believer. I was a skeptic for a long time because I like research and documents. I like proof, tangible things I can hold in my hand. And so I'd be like, I don't know if there's anything to any of this. But at the same time, I had experienced so much that there just had to be. Um, but now I've come, I've turned the corner maybe two years ago. I turned the corner. And, and I'll get into why a little later. <laughs> oh, let's just go there now. We, you can't tease us like that. Why, why did you go from skeptic to chaser of the woo? <laughs> Um, it's actually, um, the deeper I got into this and the more people I met, the more interesting people I met, um, I'm like, wow, these people wouldn't be involved in the phenomenon if there wasn't something to it. I don't think they're all disinformation officers out there. I think there's a lot of secrets being kept. And if we didn't have, if, if they weren't involved, we wouldn't have a phenomenon kind of thing. So it's almost more like the secrets and the people that are involved keep me just as fascinated as the UFO sightings we get turned in to move on. It's fascinating to me. Yeah, I, I absolutely am fascinated. See, I took a different turn coming into this. I didn't believe in this. I'd always believed in UFOs. I saw my first UFO in 1994. And I always wanted to, I always said as a, as a kid, I wanted to see three things before I die. I wanted to see a UFO, I wanted to see a ghost, and I wanted to see Sasquatch. And I've been blessed, I've, I've seen all three. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't get into this as a researcher, because I'm not a researcher. I'm a journalist by trade, and I'm an experiencer like a lot of other people. Until my own experiences started happening in my late 30s, and we're going back 10 years now. And I'll tell you, it to this day, it freaks me out in how far down the rabbit hole you go. I remember my spiritual guru, a gentleman named Pascal, who I absolutely love and adore. I remember sitting with him one day, and he's like, how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? And I said, let's just go. <laughs> what, what a bloody mistake that was. And I mean that in a good way, because it doesn't stop. It really doesn't. There's always a trail to follow. How do you follow all these trails? That's a really good question. It's hard to stay grounded, and it's such a delicate balance to me. Um, and especially, you know, getting out here now and speaking on different shows and podcasts and that, um, you know, I, it's really important to me to have that scientific researcher side. But at the same time, I've experienced some really incredible things that, you know, years ago, People would be like, wow, she's, you know, really out there in some ways, you know, just like the fairy lights you see when you're out there doing paranormal investigations, like what are fairy lights? And I didn't even believe in that until I was out there at the cemetery. And sure enough, we, we see these balls of light in the bushes and out here in the Rocky Mountains, especially we don't have fireflies. So it wasn't that they're just like little balls of energy. And I, I just couldn't believe I saw that. So you know, I think it's important. There's so many different avenues you can get into, just like you said, Sasquatch and shadow people and the high strangeness UFOs and ETs encounters and abductions that it's it's really important, I think, to find your kind of your area of interest or your niche, so to speak. Otherwise, you're just, I mean, like me, I'm kind of like the movie Up, you know, Doug the Dog. Squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. And that's my problem. I'm trying to write my second book and I just fly off in a topic and then I want to go dig and research that. And I, I just, I'm just like this all the time. So finding time to stay grounded and focusing on one aspect is pretty important and something I need to work on and get better at for sure. Cause I'm all over the place a lot of the time. For the record, <laughs> my, my dog, dog named, named Doug, Doug is, is lying, lying right, right in front oh, of my really? desk. Here. Oh, cool. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know why he does that. Well, I don't know why. We're getting a little bit of an echo that's coming from my side here, so I do apologize. We'll try and nip that in the butt here pretty quickly. But for you, when you started opening up that these experiences were real and the stories you were hearing, although there wasn't very much for evidence outside of eyewitness testimony, why did you decide as someone with a scientific background that you needed to start believing in these stories? Because this is part of a huge debate going on in the UFO world right now. Um, well, it's interesting, especially the whole, um, I, let me back up for a minute. Um, when I joined MUFON and all the things that happened on the Colorado ranch, we never knew it was ever reported or investigated. 
Um, we were told to never talk about it. We were threatened not to talk about it when we were kids. Um, so in 2013, I bought a book called Hunt for the Skinwalker by um, George Knapp and Colm Kelly, or PhD. And I just, the only thing I knew about the book was that it was about a ranch. I knew nothing about the Skinwalker Ranch at the time. Get to the chapter, other hot spots, and I start reading about our family's ranch out in Elbert County. Now, I didn't live on the ranch. I want to make that clear. Um, my mother worked for United Airlines, and um, the father of the boys that lived on the ranch, two of the youngest boys and the father lived with us during the week. Um, so they can commute to work and the boys could go to a bigger school district, Cherry Creek School District. And the oldest son stayed with his mom and her um, boyfriend at the time. They were on the ranch full time. So my sister and I would go out to the ranch on weekends, taking the boys back and forth. So we did have our own encounters out there on the ranch. Um, but um, so as soon as I knew that this was um, investigated by Dr. Leo Sprinkle, um, that's when I decided I really needed to start believing and start really digging in and researching what happened on the ranch. Um, and it was just one connection after another. So I immediately contacted Dr. Leo Sprinkle by mail. He's old school. He doesn't do computers or email or anything like that. And I received a letter back from him, him in the mail confirming, yes, this is a ranch. And I have he had all the files at the archives in Laramie. So I'm a two and a half hour drive from Laramie. So I drove down there that next week. And that's when I learned that, oh my gosh, this not only was investigated by Dr. Leo Sprinkle, PhD, um, but Peter Van Arsdale, PhD, and um, uh, ah, uh, oh, P Peter, Van a Peter Van Arsdale and um, well, I can't think of the other guy's name right now. Anyway, three PhDs investigated the ranch. And um, so, you know, from there, it's just been a journey that has unlocked a lot of answers ever since. What have you learned about yourself in this journey? Uh, what have I learned about myself? Yeah, deep question. <laughs> yeah, geez. <laughs> I think that I have learned... Um, that integrity is really important, um, that staying true to oneself is critical, to follow your passion is important. Um, I have learned to take the time to listen to others, and nothing will make you more humble than to really dig deep. So doing this book for Dr. Leo Sprinkle, this is a pioneer in the field who spent over 40 years researching this. And I guess what I learned is we're just reinventing the wheel. There's nothing that I've come up with that people haven't come up with decades before I have. So it's made me humble and really grounded. So I've learned to really appreciate um, other people's pioneering work. And I appreciate um, the fact that we may never get answers, but it's the journey along the way. And it's the people that you meet along the way um, so I think that's what I've learned. You mentioned, you mentioned something, something very, very profound, profound, which is, which is, which is we may not get answers. Mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer, Katie, that we're not ready for answers. Mm -hmm. There is a great portion of the population that are, especially those who are in this field, who, who've had their own experiences, who want to take that contact to the next level. But for the majority, like, like if I look, I look at, at my, my family, family and I and look, I look at, my at my sister and her fiance, there is no way they're ready. They're too wrapped up in their own little world. If I look at some of my friends down when I lived on the coast, there is no way they are ready because they're all about living their own perfect little lives. But if I look at the people surrounding me in my smaller community here, they're not ready. You know, and sure, I'm generalizing here for a lot of the people who I'm speaking about. However, for the most part, I don't think people are ready. And even people in this field, I don't think they really want that disclosure. They don't want that. They prefer the trickling out because it keeps their name relevant in the field. It keeps them getting invited to conferences. It keeps them get maybe getting on Discovery Channel or History Channel uh, documentaries. 
I, I see this, any type of disclosure, throwing a real wrench into things, not only with the main population, but the UFO population as well. What would be your thoughts on that? I think it's really interesting that you say that because I was just talking to somebody the other day about this very thing, how, you know, I could go listen to somebody's presentation and I, I have somebody in mind here who kind of discloses some pretty unbelievable things, but I really do believe his credibility. And I actually was just in Canyon City, Colorado, and I did um, a uh, presentation there for a group of people. Uh, you know, there's about 40 to 45 people there, not a large group, but in the audience was somebody that had high clearances and did some work on the F-14s um, through General Electric. And he disclosed some information that was pretty mind blowing. And the funny thing is you can, you can learn these mind blowing things. And then at the same time, you know, you have to go to the grocery store the next day, or I need to pick up my mom's medication, or we have to go to work and live our lives and, and, you know, pay the bills. So even though we may be in a position where we're getting some pretty incredible information about the reality of what's happening out there, the fact of the matter is we still have to live our day-to-day -day lives. So it's, it's always kind of a funny thing for me to like, well, that was mind blowing and wow, this really could be happening, but I need some milk, you know? <laughs> so I think that's really true. Uh, on the other hand, I think a lot of people probably are ready for it. Um, my, you know, I think there's a big question out there now are, you know, is there an alien invasion? I mean, some people believe there may be an alien invasion. Are they all good? Are they all bad? I don't think there's a clean cut answer. I think the answer to a lot of these phenomenon just in UFO, not only in UFOs, but the paranormal, I think it's multi-layered. I think there's many different reasons and answers for a certain type of phenomenon. I don't think we have a simple answer for any of it. But that's the issue that I think we have with a lot of people out there in accepting what we are going through. I mean, we're doing the dirty work. We're trying to bring those stories out. And mm -hmm. there's not a lot of evidence out there. Let's let's be honest and let's be clear. Outside yeah. of testimony and the odd set of dots up on a iPhone camera, <laughs> right? I mean, there's not a lot of quality evidence. So how do we turn that into getting people to believe? I think we just keep pounding at the door and keep asking questions and t keep talking to one another because you're right, this is an elusive phenomenon. And so by getting the commonalities weaved between people's testimonies and experiences, um, it just blows my mind how you can talk to one person and talk to another person. They don't know each other yet. Their stories are so similar. And I know that can be explained by, you know, popular media or TVs or just pop culture in general. Um, but one of my favorite things that turned me around and made me a believer is um, when I went to get the files from the ranch, there were a couple of drawings of the ET creatures that were seen out in Elbert County on the ranch. And the one I had never seen anything like it before. So I kind of just stuck it in my back pocket. I didn't put it out anywhere because I wanted to see if it showed up anywhere else. And this is a, a being, his head um, wasn't overly large. It, they had, he had almond eyes, but not the big wraparound eyes, wrinkles around the mouth, wrinkles on the forehead, a really heavy brow, but he had these strange looking tubes that came out. Okay. And so like a year and a half later, for Colorado MUFON, we had a guest speaker, Sean Bartok, who had written a book called Flashbacks. And I was sitting in the third row just watching his presentation. And he had property that he had in Castle Rock, Colorado, not too far from Elbert County in 1970, around the same time, you know, a few years before the Elbert County phenomenon. And up come these two drawings that were almost identical to the drawing that I had from Elbert County. And to me, that is beyond chance. That's, that is weird. It, it, I mean, I actually do, when I was at the conference in uh, Laughlin, I made a morph of the two sketches. You couldn't get them any closer. They're almost identical to one another. And we didn't know each other. We didn't collaborate. I'm like, that. that's just nuts to me. Katie Grabowski is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio, talking to UFOs. We're going to get into the ranch because I want to learn all about the ranch in the next half hour. I, something about ranches, are, there's just something 
special about them. I'll be honest with you. I'm in probably a year or two. I'm going to be looking for some property just so I could have my own woo ranch. You know, <laughs> that's what I want. I'm in, I, I'm in the middle of Sasquatch territory, right along the Gold Rush Trail, which is extremely haunted. My area has a lot of UFO activity and ET encounters. I want a woo ranch. That's what I want. I'll go out so, there and investigate. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But do you have an encounter of a story that you have have investigated over the years that has really stuck with you that yeah. you could share? Like a MUFON? Um, one thing yeah. I'd like to say about a lot of my MUFON cases, a lot of people believe that a lot of sightings are just nighttime sightings. Half of my unknown cases are daytime sightings. And some of my favorite cases are daytime sightings. So um, one, of, one of the cases that I really particularly like that sticks with me is a lady, and it's close to Elbert County. She's out here in Parker, and she's on her way to work. She sees something. At first, she's like, is that a bird? But no, it's too big to be a bird. It's at treetop level. She pulls the car over, and she's just watching this thing, and it's kind of morphing and changing shapes and She's trying to figure out what it is. And I love witnesses that actually go down the list. Okay, is this a drone? Is it a, it's not a bird. It's not a, you know, and, and they're trying to figure it out. And all of a sudden she says two F-14s come right. And she, you know, she's used to being out here at Buckley Air Force Base, which is now Space Force. But she's, she's used to seeing these, these jets come in, but they're really low, lower than she's ever seen them. They fly right at this thing. And the thing she said, it was like the special effects from a movie and it just disintegrates in front of her eyes. One jet flies to the east, one flies to the west and boom. So that's a pretty cool case. How about for ET encounters? Because I know with MUFON, you being part of their special force that never get, those are the reports that never seem to get out. Those are the reports we want. You know, is there one that, have you ever had a close encounter with an alien? I'll ask you point blank. Not that I remember. Um, not not even chasing one through a cornfield? No. Like someone else? No, but Dr. Leo Sprinkle did put me under for a little bit. And it took me like a week to listen back to the tape. And to be honest with you, um, I don't know what to make of it. I, you know, he, you know, I don't know what to make of it. I, I've had strange memories and dream type things like lucid dreams. Um, but I cannot sit here and say I had an encounter with a basketball sized blue orb that was in the corner of my room, which a couple months ago I found where I journaled about it. And I had forgotten that that same night I saw that blue basketball ball sized orb in my room. I had a Lego bucket. My kids were little at the time. I had a, a red bucket of their Legos in the corner and that had fallen over um, that same night that I saw that blue orb. And then the um, auto light from the people's house behind us came on twice. And I just thought, oh, I hadn't remembered that. Luckily I wrote it down. And I would say to anybody who experiences anything paranormal like that to write it down because you forget those little details like that. But uh, I cannot say honestly that I have seen an ET face to face. No. Oh, well, you're missing out. Oh, so you have. Oh yeah. Who hasn't? Who hasn't? You, you got aliens. I got aliens. Everyone's got aliens. You know, if you don't have aliens, what the hell are you doing in this field? That's all I'm going to say. I'm teasing. I am very much teasing. KatieGraboski.com is Katie's website. She's the head of MUFON, Colorado. Fantastic hair. Likes a cool glass of water every now and again. Nikola Tesla. We're going to find out what's with this Colorado ranch. What's it all about? What's the woo that happens there on Spaced Out Radio? All right, we're clear. <clears throat> oh, I get comfortable. You go. We're still live on YouTube, just so you oh, know. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, you can go. If you got to go to the bathroom or go fill your, uh, you know, go for a cigarette or, you know, go kiss hubby goodnight, you I go. I some ice for my water. You go. You go. Uh, we got time. Uh, Now's the time to do it. Good show so far. Very good show. Glad all of you are here. Thank you for joining us.
I don't know, man. I don't know. <clears throat> Gorgeous Gloria from Casual Conversation. How are you? Rick R Bowden, how's it going, man? Uh, the forest fires up here are starting to tame down. Uh, it seems like they're starting to get a real grasp on it. We've had some cooler weather here um, over the last few days. It's actually been getting down to single digits at night so I can finally sleep again. And it's really nice. And uh, the helicopters are all in for their uh, nighttime because I heard the last one come in right before we started the show. And, yeah, it's kind of cool. I think they're winning. I think they're winning, which is nice. I don't like forest fires. I, I'm pretty much done with them already this year. Black Rabbit, what's going on? How you doing? Mm-hmm. Katie, do you want to break into song with me? <laughs> sure. What song? <laughs> Whatever. Sure. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm getting ribbed about my shirt here. Zebra. Yeah. Yeah, getting ribbed about uh, my shirt. Uh... We have a lot of smoke here in Colorado, too. Uh, we did a field investigator training last weekend, and usually we were up in Conifer, Colorado, and you can't even see the mountain ridges. Smoke yeah. coming in from California, and fires the, are awful things. I live in a small town, very mm -hmm. small town. All right, and the other day we could not, I could not, I was coming into town, could not see the other end of town. That's how thick the smoke was. It's awful. Not good for the lungs. Somebody said a Bruce Springsteen song. <laughs> nope. He's banned from the show. He's horrible. Lunar Tina, what's happening? Did you buy us any groceries? Let us know. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Pam C. My shirt is apparently good, according to Pam. Elliot, what's going on? 416 Bitcoin. Hmm you and oh kira shame on you shame hi lovely lauren what's happening i'm gonna go change my shirt next hour i'm gonna go shirtless just for fap mm-hmm all right We have about uh, 90 seconds, maybe a minute, probably closer to a minute. My mathematics isn't very good tonight. Mark Ellens, what's happening? Harvey Greensman, how are you? Welcome. He wants us to sing House of the Rising Sun. You ready? If you start. <laughs> if, the sh if my shower was on, I'd be right into it. <clears throat> shower songs. I think everybody has a shower exactly. song. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Mine's Ebony Eyes. Do you remember that song? No. <laughs> That's good. No. <laughs> it's not a well known one. <sighs> All right. We have about uh, 40 seconds. You having fun yet? Yeah. This is fun. This is one of the funnest shows you've ever been on. <laughs> yeah. And we're only 30 minutes in. It's fast. All right. Big thank you to Media Fox, Apollo, and Michael for kicking off the super chat tonight. It's a great way to support what we do. Elliot, it is bad. You had breakfast for lunch. You know, breakfast is for breakfast, my friend. Breakfast is for breakfast. Let's remember the rules here. Thank you, Minister Elaine. We have uh, five seconds. Let's get ready to rock and roll here. Here we go, everyone. Second half hour of Space Out Radio is underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. We want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, 
Check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with our guest from MUFON, Colorado. We have Katie Grabowski. And we're going to get into this real interesting story about a Colorado ranch that she's going to get into deep detail about. Her website, katiegrabowski.com. Katie, welcome back. Thank you, Dave. All right. Tell us about this ranch. I'm excited. <laughs> well, so like I said earlier, um, this happened between 1975 and 1978. It's actually where Linda Moulton Howe got her start. She was a reporter out here in Colorado, actually lived not too far from where we lived in Englewood, Colorado. Um, and at the time, there was a huge wave of cattle mutilations to the point where they were occurring almost daily. Um, so out there on the ranch, so they bought the ranch in November of 1975. The ranch had sat vacant, vacant for 12 years beforehand. And there was already rumors of like lights and ships flying off the property. There were rumors of this disappearing structure that just the concrete was left there. Um, but it was a family's dream to have this cattle ranch. Um, so they, uh, the first week they moved in, the first kind of activity that started was this really strange humming noise that came from under, it sounded like it came from underground. And it was so loud at some times that you couldn't even hear yourself talk over, over it. Um, it sounded sometimes like a generator or a mechanical underneath the ground, though nothing was under there. So I don't know, you know, there's no tunnels, there's no caves. And these sounds would often come when they would see lights kind of fly in and out of the ranch. So it was 60 acres out there. It's still very rural today. Um, but back then there was nobody out there. Like just the driveway was a mile to get to the ranch house. Um, so the first memory, I, my sister's six years older than I am. And at the time I was nine years old. Uh, my sister was 15. And it was a spring day out in Colorado. And if you know Colorado, we get these wet, heavy snows. So it's like the sun's shining, it's nice, but there's snow on the ground kind of thing. And we were tossing the Frisbee back and forth, just you know, messing around, wasting time out on the property. And we looked down and we noticed that the dirt under our feet is dry and there's wet, heavy snow. And it was this big, huge, perfect circle. And we just, you know, at that age, we're like, wow, this is really weird. Um, later, as an investigator, I researched if there were any missile silos or anything like that out there at the time, and there wasn't. But when I I ended up, John Schusler gave me um, the briefing document um, from the ranch. And in this document, it actually talks about that big circle um, out on the ranch and um, John Durr, who was the other PhD, I couldn't remember the name of earlier. Um, they had photographs of the circle and, and that. So the humming sounds, these circles where nothing grew and, and it would just like, it would be wet here, but dry there. So that was really strange. Um, and then of course there was the scariest night on the property. Um, we were out there, I believe it was Betty's birthday celebration weekend. The adults were hanging out in the front room my sister and I and the three boys were hanging out in the boys' room, and all of a sudden the power goes out. The house is dark, and of course kids are like, ah, get the candles, flashlights. And at that time, a big bright light comes in through the window. We're all freaked out, and this was the scariest thing. And a big, booming, electrical-sounding voice is the only way that I can describe it. It basically said, you know, we have allowed you to remain. Your friends will remain silent concerning us, basically give us a, giving us a warning to remain quiet. And um, that was a really terrifying night. And that was the night when um, I got back to our house in Englewood that I went paralyzed. I couldn't talk properly. My mom and my sister were trying to figure out what the heck was wrong with me. And I couldn't say peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I started getting severe migraine headaches at the time. 
Yeah, I mean, they were like weekly, really severe migraines. And it was really interesting because a woman came up to me in Laughlin and said, you know, um, if you had this close encounter with goodness knows what, that can be like mess with the electrical signals in your brain or cause paralysis or migraine headaches. Because that's a, a symptom you hear oftentimes with close encounters are these migraine headaches. So that was a really terrifying when you're a little girl. Um, yeah. I had one too. A migraine headache? Yeah. It, it, and about half an hour later, after I realized it wasn't a migraine, it was actually shapes pulsating in my head. I went outside on my friend's property on their 10 acre mini ranch and there was a UFO on the ground. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. Yeah. Makes, makes a lot of sense what you just said. Sense. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. And then, um, so as I'm researching all this, um, the sheriff out there at the time, if you watch um, Linda Moulton Howe's movie, A Strange Harvest, do you remember that show? I've never yeah. seen it. Okay. it's I think you can get it online now, but it's on the cattle mutilation phenomenon. And in there, she actually um, interviews um, George Yarnell, who was the Elbert County Sheriff at the time, and also Bill Wall, who was the undersheriff. And so Bill Wall's um, wife and son live out in Florida. So I flew to Florida to interview Bill Waugh and, or Gene Waugh and Bill Waugh's son, Keith, and got great interviews with him. And Gene pulls out this big binder full of newspaper articles from back in the day that she had saved all these years because, you know, George Yarnell and Bill Waugh were in these articles. And she was so gracious. She's like, oh, Katie, take them home and make copies and da, da, da. And so from those articles, I was able to put together a list of more than 200 people and other ranches in the area that have also experienced not only cattle mutilations, but UFO sightings, strange humming noises, and um, all sorts of other activity. In those papers, there were articles about these menacing helicopters. And Keith Waugh and Bill Waugh talk about these choppers that would be down in the valleys and they would take off um, and we didn't know. So a big question for me was, were the helicopters in the military because we knew NORAD was involved and um, Camp Carson, Fort Carson was involved out there. So I didn't know if they were out there mutilating cattle and testing like the soil and the water for chemicals or if ET was out here doing something to the cattle and it wasn't just cattle, it was horses and um, sheep and other animals. And I think, like I said earlier, I don't think the answer is really cut and dry. I think it was both. I think both things were happening. Um, and I know that uh, Christopher O'Brien and Chuck Zukowski are kind of the cattle mutilation experts. They've been researching this area for decades in the San Luis Valley and everything out here in Colorado. Um, and I've learned a lot from them. And, you know, according to um, Christopher O'Brien, a lot of the cattle mutilations do have logical explanations for them. They are solvable, but there are those handful that are still left unknown, that are high strangeness. And in one interview that I did with another rancher, she actually grew up in the area. They have streets named after her family. I mean, they they were pioneers in this community. And um, she went to the small little high school out there. Um, in 1978, she graduated and married and moved to Rama, Colorado, which is just right on the, the border of Elbert County. And they had a lot of acreage out there and a cattle ranch as well. And her husband was out on horseback checking the property for calves. And he came upon a calf that was dead. And the calf had four cuts in a perfect square. The top of the fur was removed, but the skin was still there, but the calf was dead. And so he gets on his horse, he goes back and he gets Sheila. Sheila and her husband go back in the pickup truck. And she said that took maybe 15, 20 minutes to, to get in the truck and go back to the calf. By the time they got back, that calf had been completely mutilated, organs removed, just blood in the cavity no track marks, no helicopter sound. They're miles off the road. Nobody just pulled alongside. She said they felt like they were being watched. They said it was terrifying. Um, they're very religious people. She felt it felt evil to her. Um, and the cool thing was a few weeks later, she 
I get a message on Facebook and she found the photos. So she had photos of that calf and that mutilation. And then she also had photos of calves that were attacked by coyotes. So you could see the difference of what a mutilate the mutilated calf looked like as compared to just a, you know, a coyote that jumps on the back of a calf and, and tears it up. Um, so I have those photos and it's really cool and fascinating to have that as a comparison. So a lot of mutilations were happening and people, you know, it was an eerie time. You didn't, you didn't go up to anybody's house at night. People had loaded shotguns by their door. They had rewards out. There were newspaper articles. I mean, $10,000 reward back in the late seventies was a lot of money, you know, and at the time they thought possibly they were, um, you know, uh, religious cults, maybe mutilating these cattle, but I think we can rule that out safely. It wasn't cults because it wasn't just Colorado. This is Kansas, New Mexico, Nebraska. I, uh, Missouri, Montana. I mean, this was, these were happening all in all these different states at the same time. So what do you, let's get into the cattle mutilation phenomena here for, for a couple of minutes here, because this is one that is confusing at best. Right. You know, if you believe it's extraterrestrial and aliens are doing this, what do, do they just want a good cut of steak, you know, and, or, or some, some prime rib or is it the fact that there is something a little bit more earthbound that is causing this? I mean, cause some of these cattle that are being mutilated, the cut lines that are being fined on them are laser straight. Like you can angle them and there's, there's no, there's no hacking. There's no edges. There's no slips of the cutting as a human would do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, in the little bit of research I've done, and again, I'm not the expert in this. Like I said, Chuck Zukowski and Chris O'Brien have done a lot of work on this. And I would tell your, to tell your listeners to maybe look at their research. Um, but from the little bit I've done, I mean, I have found pictures of helicopters that are lifting a lot of cattle. I mean, I know we have the ability to lift cattle in the air and move them to places, but it's not like they're lifting them. Uh, doing the mutilations and then dropping them back down. So some some cattle were found in really unusual circumstances, you know, like um, in different positions that aren't natural to them or a log over them or under them. Um, the one, the story with Sheila with the four incisions, and then it's almost like they caught something in the act. To me, that's a pretty phenomenal story. And that doesn't sound like military to me doing that. Um, so, Again, I don't know why in the heck E.T. would want cattle and sheep. And I don't know if it's a genetic thing or if they're what sort of testing they're doing. You know, when you get into the the whys of the motivations for what's happening, that gets really convoluted. I don't have the answers to that. And that's something pretty frustrating about our job as investigators. You know, you talk and you deal with people and I love listening and getting the information so we can find these commonalities, but then they want answers. Like, who are they? What do they want? Where do they come from? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I don't have all those answers. So that could be a little frustrating. And same with the cattle mutilations. I, I don't know why ET would do that. And I, and I don't believe that, you know, I believe some of them must be. And, and my, my theory is this, first of all, uh, you know, I had to go through the process like so many people. Um, first, you have to ask yourself, do you believe in extraterrestrial life in the universe, right? And right. I can pretty much say yes. Then the next question is, do you think they have come to Earth? Um, and then if you get to a yes there, you're like, well, if they've come to Earth, would they abduct humans and would they mutilate cattle and other animals um, and possibly human would they do that? And my, I've come to the conclusion that if they've made it to earth, then of course they're going to abduct people and probably take samples of animals. Cause I, I believe we would do the same thing. If we made it to another planet, I think we would want to scientifically uh, study the life on that planet. I find it very intriguing as well. So let's go back to this farm. How often were things happening? almost daily um, when the family was there for that, those three years. Um, whether it was the humming noises or a mutilation or these helicopters going on and off the property, um, there was the um, 
adult male and the oldest son. Now I've made contact with the youngest son via Facebook. The family that owned the property, um, the the father that lived with us, the boys' dad that worked at United with my mom, he's, he recently passed away. Um, the mother is still alive and the boyfriend has passed away, but the three sons are still living. Um, they're all still terrified about what happened out there. They've all moved out of the state. They are not into UFOs. They really don't want anything to do with this. So the question I get asked a lot is, well, you know, were these people just making it up? And I actually wondered that myself for a while, like, you know, because at the time this ranch was known as Clearview and there was some questions because some of the boys had longer hair. And when you move into a really small town and you're coming from the city, there's a quite, you know, why do these guys have long hairs? Is there drugs? Are they, are they doing drugs or whatever? But the fact of the matter, matter is there's so many witnesses in so many different of the small community towns in Elbert County that it just wasn't isolated to the ranch. This phenomenon was happening to other people, including um, Bill Waugh and his family and Sheila and her family and many, many other ranchers. I mean, just look at all the newspaper articles. So this phenomenon just wasn't linked to that particular ranch and that particular family. Although it's really interesting to note that when you go out to the property, it, is, it does have the highest elevation and there's ponderosa pines all along the back. So there were Sasquatch creatures seen out there and they were menacing. They were like banging on the house and peeking from the barn and like watching the family all the time. So, um, and according to the, the um, documents here, there were hair samples found and they did cast some footprints out there. I wish I knew what happened to those because I'm really curious about it. Well, you're making us all want to go down there and check things out. You yeah. totally are. You yeah. know, it, it reminds me of my friend's ranch up here, although it was only 10 acres, small hobby farm, if you want to make it realistic. It's amazing that when you have one, how everything else goes with it. So if you're having paranormal activity, all of a sudden the fairies are there, the shadow people are there, the UFOs are there, the Sasquatch are there. Anything strange that can happen, it all seems to lump in. Did you ever wonder if it has to do with the energy of the place or if there's something like a portal calling everything in over the in or around the property? Yeah, that was... Um... <laughs> That's something I really took some time in. And again, it's, I mean, I'm not coming up with anything new here. I believe other people have thought of this and researched it as well. But get, preparing my presentation for Laughlin, I started researching, you know, the Bradshaw Ranch and the Skinwalker Ranch and the Blind Frog Ranch. And with my Mars program for MUFON, which with what Mars program is, it is a program where I had a team of 15 redactors and we went through all the Pandora files that Debbie Ziegelmeyer actually organized all these years ago. And they were pre-case management system, so pre-internet when everything was on paper for MUFON. And we went and redacted all the personal information, all the names and places of employment and phone numbers and all that. So researchers can go back and see these documents and use them. And while I was redacting these old files, I came across another ranch that predates Skinwalker Ranch and predates the Elbert County Ranch, and it's in Ohio Pile, Pennsylvania. And was in and, and the same thing, paranormal, Sasquatch, UFO sightings, humming noises, mute, I mean, all of it. And so what's interesting, I put a pin in Ohio Pile, Pennsylvania, and a pin in Skinwalker Ranch, and they're just bam, straight line across. But then I started looking at all these different ranches, and then there's another ranch called the Meadows. Um, Trey Hudson. And so I started looking at these different areas and looking at the magnetic. So there's a map, the U.S. magnetic um, geological map that you can go to online. And the lightest shade of pink is where um, the magnetism is at its highest. So the magnetism really, really pulls tight. I think the lowest is dark, dark blue where they repel each other. In, in all these high strangeness areas, all these ranches ping the charts. They're the lightest shade of pink you can get. So they're very highly magnetically charged. And it's my belief there has to be something to that. You know, there just has to be. I don't know if it's opening gateways or doorways or portals or what. 
I don't know what it is. I don't know. I, I And the problem is, even if you think it's portals, there's no way to test for this. It's all based on assumption. Right. This is where it becomes a real pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. I think also what's really important is because, <laughs> you know, even two years ago, if I talked about this, I was really hesitant to talk about what Bill Wall, the sheriff, talks about. So he talks about, and I and his wife and his son remember this very well, that he was on patrol one night. He sees this these lights, okay? And it's by a tree and he pulls up closer and it's this box. So I witnessed the box and the sheriff witnessed the box and a couple other people on the property, the oldest son and John witnessed the, bro the box out there. And it, it's, this box is about 17 inches long, about six inches wide. It had lights and it made this like bee noise, like made this noise and the box would disappear. And so Bill Waugh said he, he didn't want to approach the box. So he goes in town, he gets a posse sheriff. They go back to approach the box and the box is gone and the tree is gone. He said, it's like they went into the ground. Now that would kind of speak about a portal or a tunnel. And that sounds absolutely nuts to me, but it's been witnessed by several people. And what blew my mind was uh, when I was talking with Trey Hudson on the meadows and um, James Keenan, they have witnessed the box just recently. Here I am thinking, oh, the box is long gone. We haven't seen it in 40 years. And they've just recently seen the box and they had a box encounter on Skinwalker Ranch. So whatever these boxes are, I, I have no idea. Um, I do have a theory on what two possibilities of what they could be. We have one minute. Okay, we'll save that. <laughs> we'll save the possibilities. Were there ever aliens seen on the ground? Yes, not by me, but by the older gentleman and the oldest son. Yes, they, they had two different types, and they said they were in conflict with one another. Oh, nice. Aliens battling it out on your property. Right, and we were just like, you're in our way. We're, we're, we're gonna, we've allowed you to remain, but you're really just in our way. Leave us alone, we'll leave you alone kind of thing. That's what's reported in the report. Wonderful. I couldn't imagine what that would be like to have aliens duking it out in a big, you know, street brawl right in the middle of my cornfield or my hay field. <laughs> you know, you know, they what do they do? They bring in a, a crop circle to cut out a ring, you know, so that way there's one alien sitting on the outside with a bell, ding ding, let's go. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But what's fascinating is how differently look. And I'll talk about that, too, when we come back. The two different ones that were spotted out there. I don't know. That, that sounds like a plan. Okay. Let's get into some aliens next with Katie Grabowski. She likes her aliens. Never seen one, as far as she knows. But she likes them aliens. She's chasing them for MUFON in Colorado and all over the United States and North America. She is a great speaker. She's a great author. You can find her book on Amazon. Katie Grabowski. Dot com is her website. And when we come back, we're going to get into aliens. What is happening on this Colorado ranch? And, of course, Katie's two-point opinion of what the heck is going on. Katie Grubowski joins us for Hour 2 of Spaced Out Radio, coming up right after this. All right, we're clear. I'm going to just uh, run my dogs outside. I'm going to refill my glass, and I'll be right back, okay? Sounds good. I'm going to mute you, and I'll be right back. Be right back, people. Find that Stevenson. Are you staying?
I like it when you come to work. I do. All right, I am back. Let's bring Katie up here. We have about one minute left. Anybody new join us? Jazz, thank you so much for that super chat, man. Really appreciate that, Jazz. And thank you to Media, Fox, Apollo, and Michael for the great super chats. We really do appreciate the support here that you have of SOR. Thank you so much. <coughs> Excuse me. You having fun yet? Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> I thought so. All right. So we got about uh, 35 seconds before we're going to come back from break. Make sure I'm not missing anybody who's entered the chat room. Snakes on a UFO, what's happening? Thanks for joining us. I did put on an identical shirt. That's right. Fullerene, how you doing? Welcome to the show. We've got five seconds here. Let's get ready to rock and roll, everyone. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Kicking off hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Thank you to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Lectisternium. Lectisternium. I probably butchered that, but the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram spaced out radio show we continue on tonight with katie grabowski she is the head of mufon in colorado state director she likes her aliens she likes her ufos she likes her weird haunted ranches her website katie .com. katie thank you so much for joining us of course now right before the break you were going to tell us a story about these aliens that were walking around this colorado ranch right so the oldest gentleman and the oldest son apparently had encounters and these telepathic communications with these beings that are out there. I personally never saw them, nor did my sister. Um, but we got to hear, you know, every Sunday night when the boys would come back, we'd hear about the things that were going on at the ranch. And it's also in the briefing document that I acquired years later. Um, and like I said earlier, we have those sketches I don't know if I held them up, but I kind of described what they look like. They're in, in the book Letters of Love and Light, where you can see the two comparisons side by side. Um, but according to the briefing document, they were two different types seen out there. One was very mechanical, which interestingly enough, I was just standing in line at the grocery store one day, you know, buying my peas and my, <laughs> my steak. And I'm looking at the magazines and there was an issue of Popular Science and they had um, AI on the cover. And it looked pretty similar to the drawing of the weird tube guys. And I'm like, well, that's sort of interesting. I wonder if that's some sort of an AI type of mechanical. And of course, the mechanical voices, um, are those connected? Could it be like an AI type being? And then the other um, entity that was seen on the property were more humanoid-like, kind of like the, um, the Nordic type of ET being, um, and they said that they were in conflict with one another. What that conflict is, I do not know. But basically the gist of it was, hey, we're here doing what we need to do, whether they were there um, to 
I know that on um, Skinwalker Ranch, I, I believe, and the um, Blind Frog Ranch, they're looking at um, Gilsonite. I don't know if that's a man-made. I don't know a lot about Gilsonite, but I don't know if there's certain mineral, minerals or meteorites on these locations or if it has to do with the geological areas that maybe they're there. I don't know the whys of things, but that's what was reported out there. Interesting. Now mm -hmm. you have a couple of theories as to what's going on there. What's your well, theories? I had some theories on the boxes because when I interviewed Sheila, she had mentioned, and I had read this in um, other reports. And when I talked to other ranchers that um, as far as the cattle are concerned, the cattle where the mutilations were occurring, the cattle would all kind of huddle together and be really calm. But the cattle in adjoining pastures where the mutilations were not occurring were really freaked out and like um, acting erratic uh, and, and kind of just, they were just freaked out. And so I had wondered if the boxes were sort of some sort of calming device or some sort of mind control device. That's one theory. The other reason I say that is in the report, it talks about um, a officer from Camp Carson going out and investigating the property. So we know there were people out there um, from the military investigating the area. And he had mentioned that in the Ponderosa Pines in the back of the ranch house, he felt like something took over his mind and would pull, like, pull him into the um, Ponderosa Pines and then would release him and he would run back and then it would take over his mind and then it would release him. And he, and he said that happened five times, which apply, implies to me some sort of mind control device. Um, and I thought, hmm, that, that would make sense. Or my other theory is maybe if they were, com if they were communicating like that disembodied electrical voice we heard, if that box wasn't some sort of a uh, communication device those are just some thoughts that I personally have. Do you think that Colorado being a very militarized state, including the head of NORAD at Cheyenne Mountain, do you think the military has any play in this? Yeah, I, I think I do. Um, <laughs> I do. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple of reasons for that. A, there's no question we have photographs that the military, they were out there. I have notes and documents um, stating, you know, that NORAD was involved and they were instructed to handle Bigfoot. And actually, they even told um, George Yarnell and Bill Waugh to really stop going out on these cattle mutilations, cattle, cattle mutilation calls um, to kind of, you know, tuck it under the rug, so to speak. Um, but one of the things that um, I've been really researching lately and I find interesting in the in this document here, they talk about two A7D interceptors that crashed in pursuit of a UFO. And I'm like, well, certainly if two interceptors crashed, there would be articles or some news about it. So I was able to locate um, some newspaper articles about these two interceptors that went down. And then just yesterday, I get this in the mail. So I can see why John Greenwald gets really excited about FOIA requests because I FOIA requested to Kirkland Air Force Base about the two A7D interceptors that went down. So I spent yesterday combing through this huge stack of the incident report to see if there's anything unusual. A good portion of it is redacted out, but what I find unusual about it, A, is A, it matches the time of these high mutilations. Um, B, in this report, it states that um, it was a pilot and a trainer, and the, um, the cause was that the instructor told the um, pilot to turn on his um, uh, beakers, his lights, and he turned them off and ran into it. But what is stated in here is one of the pilot's misidentified another craft's lights. And this is out in the middle of nowhere and it doesn't even mention anything more about what that other craft was and then it's all redacted out. So the, the two interceptors hits, hit each other in the tail 
They both crashed, both pilots eject and they both survived. Um, but another interesting thing is um, they were loaded and armed with live ammunition, which from what I understand, and people out there can correct me if I'm wrong that are out there in the military, but during training missions at night over civilian um, homes, I don't think it's normal to have loaded ammunition on these jets. So I just find the whole thing really unusual. And it is reported from the sheriff that they were in pursuit of a UFO. Now it doesn't say this in, in these documents, but I was able to get verification that these two interceptors did go down. So I think that's pretty interesting stuff. I also know from a Canadian standpoint, I don't know if you know this or not, but every UFO call that goes into the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, that file goes right onto the desk of the staff sergeant who immediately has to send that report to Ottawa at RCMP headquarters who immediately sends that report to Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado, oh. where from there they send out the two closest CF-18 Hornets to try and intercept the craft. Interesting. And you know, which also... To that other report I talked about earlier of the lady with the two. That's really interesting. Which, which also means, and this is where it gets a little bit interesting, and I've talked to people in Ottawa about this, uh, who are part of the government, mm -hmm. that every report that they take down... So when the RCMP asks for a report of what you saw, they're asking for your name, your, your birth date, your phone number, your address, any other witnesses. All of that information goes to Colorado as well. Oh, which, wow. which means that any Canadian who has reported a UFO to the RCMP and they have taken a full statement now has all of their information sitting in Cheyenne Mountain. Interesting. I just hiked around Cheyenne Mountain a couple of weeks ago on my way back from Canyon City when I did that thing. I, they, they have a little park there, and you can hike kind of at the base of it. It's the Cheyenne Mountain State Park. And, and of course, you can't get any closer than that. But, you know, I do believe Chris, Christopher O'Brien talks about a cattle mutilation where the cattle that was mutilated was actually on the doorstep of NORAD. Um, so there was a whole event with a mutilation with that. Um, I believe that, um, I think a couple things were happening out on that ranch. I believe, and that's something I've asked my witnesses time and time again, that I've interviewed that went through things that had experiences at the time. I'm like, do you believe the military or NORAD or our government, whoever, the powers that be, were out there creating and trying to scare the bejeebas out of people or was something really unusual from ex some extraterrestrials out there creating this. And I think it's a combination of both. I think both things were happening. And interestingly enough, and I'm going to bring up something really controversial here, <laughs> um, but you know, out in Laughlin, they had Richard Doty out there. And Richard Doty, for many who know, he is a proclaimed disinformation officer. I mean, he has told us that's what he did for, for the military, but he was there speaking. And so he was walking out the door, I was walking in the door and I kind of cornered him and I, I asked him a few questions. I didn't know if he had a Colorado connection at the time, but I kind of just wanted his opinion on, you know, hey, was NORAD, was the military involved? And he said exactly that. Number one, he kind of told me, he's like, if you want to find information, he said, oh, we were just talking about your presentation. I don't know who we was, but he said, we were just talking about your presentation. And I said, well, where can I get information about these two A7D interceptors? And he said, well, you need to FOIA the mishaps office in Kirtland. So he did do that. And that's who I got the response from uh, and these papers from. Hopefully they're legit. And then secondly, um, he said um, he believes that there were um, psychological DARPA experiments going on at the time, as well as unidentified flying objects and unknown things happening at the time. So, and from my evidence in the research I've done, that would line up with what I have found as well. You believe though it's all tied together, the cattle mutilations, the alien sightings, do you believe the the paranormal happenings or the cryptid happenings are tied in as well? 
I do for these high strangeness ranches. And, and I, even outside of that, I've talked to so many abductees and people who have ET contact or close encounter sightings that all of a sudden after that happens, and Dr. Leo Sprinkle's work talks about this as well, where all these other paranormal pieces start entering their lives that coincide with these this contact, right? Um, Dr. Leo Sprinkle called them the packs or stages that ET experiencers go through. And I have found that true with so many people that I have talked to, whether it's lucid dreams starting up, um, intuitive psychic abilities getting enhanced, um, hearing strange knocks or noises in the house or shadow figures, or seeing these balls of light. Some are blue, some are orange. I hear orange orbs a lot. So there's just these check boxes that as an investigator and a researcher, you start hearing it over and over and over. You kind of have this list in your mind like, oh yeah, heard that before and heard that. And a lot of them are tied together. Now, when it comes to the Sasquatch beings, that's really interesting too. I think his name is Stan Gordon wrote a good book. Um, I have it here in my library somewhere on the um, Sasquatch and the UFO encounters. Oh yeah, here it is. It's a silent, hold on. silent invasion, the UFO Bigfoot casebook. Um, and this is interesting too, because just like the, the ranches, it's, it seems from his research that some of the Bigfoot encounters also have a UFO connection and some don't. So I don't know if that's, it's an interdimensional thing, you know, sometimes you hear the Bigfoot accounts where you'll see just a, a flash of light and then boom, they're gone. You also hear the accounts of Sasquatch um, encounters where they have these telepathic thought. So I don't know if they're ET beings themselves or connected to the ETs or what, but the, e the Sasquatch that were out on the Elbert County property definitely were connected to the craft because they're certainly not spotted out there all the time or anymore. It was like they were there only because the craft were there. So do you, Okay, that leads to an interesting question because a lot of Sasquatch researchers do not believe there is a tie to UFOs and or extraterrestrial content. But in a, in a case like this, where it's both happening on the same property, you would mm -hmm. think that there is a correlation between the two. Absolutely. And it, my sister's very analytical. Um, she's in radio and stuff. And she she uh, had a, a separate experience, separate from my own. She actually went to the high school prom with the oldest son. Um, and they went to the ranch property at night um, after prom. And they experienced a, a downcraft. And she well, she was like the, the Sasquatch Bigfoot creature they saw was almost like a bodyguard or workers, like they were directly connected. So maybe, you know, only a handful of them are, but I think some definitely are. There's too many reports that state that if you go through history. Yeah, and, and I agree. And, and I'm surprised that more aren't looking into the tie between the two, because mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer there is an invisible thread, Katie, that really connects the paranormal to the cryptid world, to the UFO world, to the extraterrestrial world. I really think that is the next place that we need to start investigating as investigators. As I think we've tried to segregate every topic way too much to the point where we don't want to believe there is connection between it all. But when you see a case like this, where on one property you have everything happening you there is no other solution then this is all tied together mm -hmm. and i wish more researchers would take the time to understand that absolutely and, and and not only just the phenomena i mean our five senses right i mean there's also the whole other side of it that you can't see touch taste feel which is this whole intuitive psychological side of it too, which to me is just as important, the lucid dreaming and the enhanced abilities with so many contactees all have a big role in the whole phenomenon as well. I, like you, believe that there are so many cases and so much evidence that tie these phenomena together and that's in where the answer is going to lie somehow, some way. 
Katie Grabowski is our guest tonight on Space Down Radio. We have just over four minutes before we have to go to break at the bottom of the hour. Kate, with this ranch, and we're going to change topics at the bottom of the hour, but with this ranch, do you want or do the current owners allow any type of investigation there? No, they don't. I mean, it's a gated community right now. I left them a note pre-COVID, and she responded. And then COVID hit, and I felt very strongly like this was something I didn't want to tell her over the telephone or text about. I wanted to meet her in person. Um, after the restrictions kind of lifted and restaurants started to open, I left her a message and she didn't get back with me. So I'm still sort of knocking at her door. I think it's a delicate subject. Um, we don't get very many reports out in Elbert County anymore um, as far as MUFON is concerned. But what's interesting about that is I'm, you know, I talk with Sheila who knows a lot of the ranchers and she actually just had a photograph of a recent mutilation. And a lot of these ranchers don't report anymore, especially if it's a mutilation, because A, they don't want the stigma. B, they know nothing's going to happen. They don't get reimbursed. I think a lot of them write it off as a loss on their taxes. Um, I do believe that for a while, though, that the government was secretly writing checks for some of these mutil mutilated cattle, which then would indicate that, yes, they had a hand in some of these. That's what I've heard. I don't know if that's true. I need to ask Chris about that one. Um, so a lot of these things don't get reported, you know, that small town stigma mentality. And that's why I say Elbert County and I don't give the exact town in Elbert County. Elbert County has five really small towns and they're all very small communities. Um, and the fact of the matter is there were um, mutilations and activity happening in all the little towns within the county so but i you know so this is a known secret that people don't talk about yeah now as time is winding down here we got about two minutes does temperature or weather have anything to do with these mutilations or the activity that is there i don't believe so um but you know, I don't rule out a geographical connection. And then, of course, there's the whole Native American folklore. I mean, especially with Skinwalker Ranch with the Ute tribes. And the Ute did um, hunt in that area. I mean, they kind of hunt and traveled over into Colorado from Utah. Um, we had Cheyenne and Arapaho out there. And there are cliff, um, cliff dwellings and um, petroglyphs out there um, on some of the rock faces. Um, so... I don't know if there's that native tie. Um, there's also some spooky folklore that happened back in the wooded area in the Ponderosa Pines. Um, there were um, bank robbers, three of them actually, that were in a in a wagon that were cuffed to the ankles and, and to the hands and they were snagged and actually hung out in those Ponderosa Pines. Um, so that's kind of creepy and spooky. I don't know if that you know, makes it more haunted out there or, or what, but that Native American connection I wonder about as well. Um, so that's kind of fascinating, the history of the, the land itself. No kidding. No kidding. Well, that, that's pretty interesting regarding that because I, I, I was wondering if, if the weather is like what it's like up here where I am, the, you get four seasons. You don't get, you know, a long summer and then a cool down and then a long summer again. That's true. So That's I was wondering, like, if it's, say, minus 20 Fahrenheit, are you getting action with UFOs and cattle mutilations at that temperature? Yeah, actually, you know, when they bought the ranch in November, it kind of starts in the winter months. And they talk about how you couldn't even drive down this long driveway because it was snow, so snowy out there. And they were getting the humming noises and the mutilations even in the snow. And the footprints they got were in the snow. So, yes, it was happening in all the seasons. You know, in Colorado, we definitely get the winter and the fall and spring and summer. And especially in the late 70s, our weather's kind of changing in the last 10 years or so where it seems like our winters are getting shorter and more mild and our summers are getting hotter. It's been dang hot here this summer. <laughs> um, well, but, we're getting dang hot summers. We're getting dang cold winters. Yeah. And a lot of snow here in British Columbia. But nonetheless, when we come back with Katie Grabowski, what's it like to chase aliens? What's it like to chase down UFOs? What kind of running shoe do you wear for that? 
We'll be back with more Spaced Out Radio right after this. All right, we're clear. Good times. <laughs> Let's see, I wear a high heel shoe. <laughs> no, I, that would not surprise me. A <laughs> nice stiletto will always do that. What a way to run through a cattle field in a nice stiletto. Closed toe so the poop doesn't get in there. <laughs> That's funny. IFG or FVGBE342, what's happening? I have a few minutes, right, Dave? Yeah, we got about four and a half minutes. I'm going to go to the restroom really fast. You go, girl. You go. <laughs> Hi, Dirty Filth. What are you drawing now, Filth? Oh, stiletto heels running through. That's what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Make sure they're closed toe, buddy. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Really, Minister Elaine? What is that like? It's got to be grotesque. the hell are you insulting my shirt here? Dave has lions outside his house all the way from Africa for wearing that shirt, tricking those poor cats into him being Juicy Zebra. That's terrible. Chris Mo, Troy SR71, how are you? We're at 201 people. That is phenomenal. Awesome. Thank you all for listening tonight. Yeah, Katie's great, isn't she? Don't tell her I said that. She's coming back. I didn't hear you. <laughs> okay, good. It's kind of cool. We're over 200 people live. Awesome. Hi. Yeah. Yeah, everyone's loving on you. They're already asking, when's Katie coming back? When's Katie coming back? When's Katie coming back? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. She might not even like us. We might be. She might not understand our Canadian accent. Hi, gorgeous Beverly Holmes. How are you? Thank you, Alan Hold. What's with the? Why are you knocking the shirt? My shirt is fantastic. It's comfy. Comfy. You must be a musician. Learning to be. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Fabster, for that great super chat. Appreciate you, brother. Really do. Uh, I always wanted to learn how to play guitar, and I was never allowed to as a kid. And then as an adult, I got this one for my 39th birthday. Nice. And just never had time to take lessons. And so now I'm in lessons. My son is in lessons because uh, I have a little eight-year-old metal head. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Hi, Aiden. How are you? Yeah. Um, let's see. What's he into right now? He just found Green Day and Nirvana. Nice. Yeah. He, he sits on YouTube and uh, just plays music. That's awesome. Irish Lincoln, how you doing? 
I just bought a t-shirt with the Nirvana logo from Disneyland and it has the aliens from the the cantina, you know, band. His mm -hmm. shirt. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. All right, big thank you to Fap, Snakes, Jazz, Media Fox, Apollo, and Michael for the amazing super chats. It's a great way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. And if you're new, give us a thumbs up. If you've just hit that subscribe button, ring the bell. We are here seven days a week for you. And so check us on out. Here we go, everyone. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Thank you so much for tuning us in. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you for joining us on the Mighty SOR. I want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with State Director for MUFON in Colorado, Katie Grabowski. Fantastic hair, excellent speaker, and we're going to bring her back on. Her website is katiegrabowski.com. If you want to check it on out, which we suggest you do, Katie, welcome back. Thank you, Dave. All right, let's get to the important stuff right off the bat. What kind of shampoo and conditioner are you using? <laughs> oh my gosh, um, I use uh, the big, the big purple stuff. What is it called? Um, oh, I don't know the name of it. <laughs> it's expensive though. My hair salon. Uh, yes, I don't, I don't know the name of it. I don't know the name of mine. It just smells good. Yeah, it smells good. You know, and that's that's all that matters. How does it smell? Good, good enough. Yes, stay away from the head and shoulders in the panty. Definitely, definitely. And a good conditioner also works. Enough hair talk already. What's it like to chase down UFOs and aliens? Well, it's it's jumping into the rabbit hole and never getting out. Um, I quit my full time job and I do this full time now because um, it just consumes so much of my time. Um, I guess I'm pretty dogged in that way, and I, I want answers. <laughs> so, and I do love going to archives. Um, so, I have a whole other case we haven't even touched on that I, I've been uh, working on for over two years. And once you get a really good case that really grabs your interest, it's, you know, it's hard to get out of that. And I just love hearing other people's experiences and making those connections. Well, tell us the story of this case you've been working on for two years. Well, it's it, it's um, it's something I haven't made public quite yet because I've been collecting documents and coming up uh, with my hypothesis because it's a very well known case. Um, it is uh, has to do with a Roswell body and where it was taken. So, Brigadier General Arthur Exxon. Was rumored. It was rumored that one of the Roswell ET bodies was um, taken to and housed in a at a mortuary outfit here in Denver. So a few years ago, a report came in um, from a very nice couple in California whose father um, was best friends with the mortician in a uh, in a mortuary in Denver. And um, this gentleman, whom I went out to New Mexico and interviewed twice now. Um, he has since passed away, so I'm very lucky that we got his testimony on camera and documented. Um, but he pulled what he called his caper one evening because this vault was sitting down in the mortuary in Denver in a room where they stored the folding chairs. And it was a vault just sitting in the corner, and he did not think there was a body in there. Um, he thought maybe there were papers or who knows what, but, you know, the owner of the mortuary, which I'm not going to give the name to yet, um, 
but uh, said, you know, don't check, don't touch this. There's a hold on it by a judge. And so this judge had had put a hold on this body um, for decades, which is really interesting. And I've learned since that the judge was a federal judge and he was appointed by Nixon. Um, so I've been researching the judge who has also passed away, but an interesting twist of fate. My mother was living in an assisted living home at the time, and she wanted me to give a presentation to the residents there. So I did a little presentation, UFOs 101. And I was telling the nice folks after the presentation about the mortuary and the Roswell body and the judge that had a hold on the body. And one of the residents goes, oh, blank name. I'm not ready to give the name yet. Um, his widow's on the fifth floor. You want me to go get her? So I've been able to interview the judge's wife twice. Uh, I've been to the Eisenhower archives because the, the judge and his wife live two doors down from Mamie Eisenhower, who has a Denver connection. So there's an Eisenhower connection, mortuary connection, and then the judge was also a 30, 33 degree mason. And the lodge is just right down the street from the mortuary, the Mason Lodge and really close to Fitzsimmons and Lowry Air Force Base. So there's this whole connection. I've been to the Eisenhower archives several times and I've been gathering documents because when I bring this story out to the UFO community, I really need to have my ducks in a row. I have a lot of them in a row. Um, but when I come out with all the, the details and all the facts and all the names, um, I, I really need to have all that together. Um, and I've been working on this for a couple of years. It's really intriguing. I think I even know where they've moved the little body to, um, but I need ways to prove that. So I'm in the process of doing sa soil samples and I'm hoping to find somebody to help me do some research on this as far as ground penetrating radar and some, some things like that. So it's a super exciting case with really credible people. My first question though, um, to the mortician was why didn't, it, when you opened it and looked at the body. So he pulled his caper in the middle of the night, he opened the vault inside the vault, um, was a child size casket. So he, you know, op unzips the thing. It's soaked in seven layers of formaldehyde. And he said all the visceral was completely removed and the genitals were completely cut out. The ET had almond-shaped eyes, a heavy brow, orifices for ears. Um, he couldn't see the neck because the way the body was laying. The, the skin was really grayish blue leathery, but he did not think ET at the time because my first question was, well, why didn't you take pictures? Why didn't you, if you thought it was an ET Roswell body, why didn't you take pictures? But he didn't connect it to that at the time. At the time he was like mortified that this was a child's casket and he felt that he violated this little being and he thought maybe perhaps it was a severely hydrophysalic child or a very um, malformed child at the time. It wasn't until years later that him and his wife were hang gliding. They were hang gliders in Roswell, New Mexico that they just happened to stop by the museum. And he heard the rumor from General or Brigadier General Arthur Exxon that one of the bodies was stored in a mortuary outfit in Denver and all the bells went off, ding, 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 ding. Oh my God, that's what I saw. Um, you know, so it's it's a really super interesting case and very credible. When you break it, we'll have airtime for you. Absolutely. I would love to. Sure. You I kind break of it. broke it already a little. <laughs> okay, so... If I get this right, just to summarize, because uh -huh. I never get to use the word summarize a lot on this show. Basically, one of the bodies from Roswell ended up in Denver. Yeah, in a mortuary in Denver, which would make sense to me because at the time, Fitzsimmons was a pretty big deal. And I believe they autopsied one of the bodies at Fitzsimmons. My, my kind of my logical thinking is, why put all your eggs in one basket? Why wouldn't you take one and autopsy it at Fitzsimmons? Why it ended up in the basement of a mortuary, I do not know. I even went down to um, the uh, probate offices and tried to get like any documents because if the body was held by a judge, they should have documents. The problem is you need a name or you need a file number. And of course I don't have a name of the little ET and I certainly don't have a file number. The ties to Eisenhower are very intriguing to me mm -hmm. because a lot of this UFO 
history seems to tie around Roswell and his history as a general coming out of World War II, getting into politics, and then the alleged scenario where on the West Coast he went to meet with extraterrestrials at what is now Edwards Air Force Base. And whether or not that actually happened or if he went to L.A. for an emergency tooth extraction. What do you think happened there? Well, <laughs> since this Roswell body case for me, I think he actually did go meet with these ETs. I think that um, he's protecting this little one that is in Denver. Um, that's what I think. Um, yeah, I think there's truth in that story. All right, let's get to a question from Jim, and he is asking, I'm surprised we haven't had more audience questions for you tonight, the way they are loving on you. Uh, Jim is asking, do you think these aliens would want their dead back? Well, yeah, we would want ours back. I do. Don't you? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I mean... Let's see. I mean, there's so many things that could go on here. But, let you know, I mean, I if there's a deal made, okay, if there's a deal made, Humans for Technology, that Eisenhower did make, it would make sense that the ETs didn't ask for this body back. Right. If they, yeah, that's part of the, and, and, like I said, I think I know where this little body is. And I think this body, that's part of the reason it was held. I think it's been treated with respect. I i, I don't, this body, I believe, wasn't cut up in a, a lot of pieces. I think this body was laid to rest with respect. So maybe that was part of the deal. Do you think that the body has been buried since then? And maybe it's either been cremated or in a mortuary somewhere or buried in, in an unknown grave at some cemetery. Yes, I think it's the, the very last thing you said. <laughs> I think it's, it's been put to rest in an unmarked grave in, in a cemetery. Any clues to where that cemetery may be or grave I, marker? I do, but I can't really say right now. What's interesting about it, though, is everywhere around where I believe this body to be, it's very green and lush, except for where that body is. And now it's been two years, and every spring and summer, it's the same thing. Dead grass, dead where I think it is. Um, and I will disclose it eventually. I'm just doing more testing and still, like I said, getting my ducks in a row. But, yes, I believe this body was treated with respect, and I, I believe that maybe is part of the deal there. Yeah. Do you think that going on in the future, if you're able to prove what you can prove on this, that it might be caused to have that body exhumed? It'll never be able to happen because where it is. That I mean, is it in a military cemetery? I can't tell you. I can't. Well, tell. well, that would tell. You know what? I'm just going to assume that because that just makes sense. Yeah. That I mean, just makes is, sense. Where it is, I believe it makes it makes sense where it's placed, and I don't think it ever could be touched where it's placed. And it would make logical sense to me. Um, all of it sort of makes sense. It's like, where do you hide a book? You hide a book in a library. Where do you hide a body? You hide a hide a body in a mortuary. <laughs> I mean, it sort of all makes sense. Um, so. Um, again, COVID shut down the archives. I have more leads and more boxes I need to go pull. And uh, just recently contacted the other um, University of Nebraska. And I can uh, go. Um, they open it up for more research in September. Hopefully they do if things don't reverse again. So I'm hoping to go back and, and finish up the research on this topic because it is fascinating. And I believe I believe it makes a lot of sense to me, and the, the people involved make make a lot of sense to me. Any way of sneaking into that ground and maybe stealing some of the soil from there? I did. Ooh, <laughs> you little thief, you! Yeah. And I, I I had my kids film it. <laughs> Is that pretty bad? So I I had my daughter and my son out there with me, and I'm like, okay, you got to get this on film. But the first time I did it. I didn't do it correctly. I had the gloves and I just did topsoil. But then I knew I, after I researched more, I realized I needed to get a core tool. So I'm um, going back and doing it with the correct tool. So I have to go back and sneak in there and do it again. But um, with all the right equipment this time. 
Got to do it at night. Yeah. Be camouflaged. <laughs> I don't think I can get in at night. You just have to sort of be nonchalant in the day. Hope nobody sees you there. <laughs> right. I can I can use my kids as like, oh, it's a science experiment for my kids' science project. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully nobody is watching this show. No. All right. Another question from our audience. YJ is asking, can you speak more about the conflict between the alien species here? Well, I, you know, I didn't witness this, witness it, and I can only go what's reported. Um, and what my beliefs and what makes sense to me is that, you know, I believe that there's maybe a AI, more mechanical type of species in this more um, angelic kind of species, probably, maybe. I mean, I'm speculating here, but maybe, you know, certain races out there want to help humanity and protect us and others could care less and want to, you know, reap our planet. I don't know what it is, um, but, you know, when you get into the whys, it's hard to say, but I just know that there were two different beings. And what's interesting too, two different phenomena. So the electrical beings in the report, the ones with the tubes, Anytime those beings were around is when that humming noise and the box and the paralysis would come. Because there's several reports of the mom and the older son and even myself experienced where you'd go paralyzed um, or fall unconscious to the floor or unable to move. And that seemed to only happen with the mechanical beings. The other beings, that didn't happen or it wasn't reported anyway. So that's kind of interesting. All right, let's get to another one. Space Cow is asking, do you think the Nephilim are here right now? Uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure. I know there's some folks that believe that they're walking amongst us. Um, that That's a possibility, I suppose. You know, I, I, I'm not sure. I believe that, I mean, just like in the paranormal ghost world, we could have ETs all around us and we just can't see them. Um, just like with a ghost. Another question from Jim. The alien DNA of the body may be seeping into the soil. That's huh? what you're hoping? Interesting. I, I, I don't know. I think um, it would be in a vault. So I don't know if it could seep out of the vault because it's like concrete. There's actually, I actually have the mortician talking about how it's a vault within a vault within a vault. So it's like in three layers. Plus it would be in a zip, zip bag with formaldehyde. So I don't know, you know, what would be causing the, the grass to be dead there exactly. I just wanted to compare the soil to see if there were any differences at all between a healthy part of where the body is and, you know, the dead part and see what the differences are there. Because I'm not sure what's causing the grass to die there. Tony is asking, have you collaborated with Linda Moulton Howe? And did you come up with any new information? I haven't collaborated with Linda. Um, I met her only once. And I'm not sure if she'll be at this year's symposium in Las Vegas. But I hope to talk to her more. I was supposed to be good at that. Apparently, I was on the short list to speak there. Oh, Maybe next year. Well, and you need to get out of Canada first. I know. I know. <laughs> Drop my name there next year. I want to be will. there. I definitely will. Yes. You and Tom Whitmore, my two MUFON buddies, go go yeah. drop the gloves and say, we got to get Dave down here. Got to get Dave down Tom, here. Tom's awesome. I love Tom Whitmore. Mm -hmm. That man is like an encyclopedia. Yeah. Yes, there are several of those within MUFON. It blows my mind. And I am not one of those people that just can pull out dates and names and ah, it just blows my mind. It's wow. Tom and I talk every week. That's awesome. Every week we have a phone call. And uh, there's not enough good words out there to say what I think about Tom Whitmore. Yes. All right, let's get to Beverly's question. The lovely and talented Beverly is asking... Katie, what are your thoughts on consciousness initiated contact like CE5? <laughs> that is a tricky question when you're a MUFON state director. Um, <laughs> so 
I believe that there's definitely a consciousness connection to ET. Um, I believe that you can certainly meditate and communicate in your mind. Um, whether you can draw them in on command is something else altogether. Um, I don't think it's as easy as, oh, I, you know, on the other hand, I have done that on several occasions and I will see a flash, like somebody's taking a picture in the sky, like just a flash, like boom. And I'm like, and my logical side will kick in and say, oh, that's just a tumbling satellite or a, an iridium flare or something like that. So I'm very equal brained. I have that logical side that I'll just dismiss it. So yes, I believe that some people can do that. And I absolutely 100% believe that there's a consciousness connection to ET contact. Is that a good answer? I mean, that that's the best way I can answer that. It works, it works for, me. for me. Yeah. There's that There's darn, that echo, darn echo, again. echo again. Don't know, Don't what, know causes what causes that every now. I think I get too close to my microphone, and that's what happens because sometimes I get excited to get around the microphone. It's my fault. You have to be really careful. I want to say one other thing about that. You have to be really careful about the calling them in and doing because where, where I have a problem is when people start making money off of other people um, to do things like that. So I would just be really careful with that. Um, you don't need, you can just do it yourself for free, you know, in other words. Yes, <laughs> I, I would agree with you. You don't need to be spending $2,500 to go watch Dr. Wu and his uh, clan go find aliens when you can do it in your own backyard if you right. follow if you follow those steps. And, and to be honest with you, if you want to go down that road, as we only got about two and a half minutes here before we have to go to break at the top of the hour, it really is all about clear consciousness. Yeah. Having a clear conscious, clear mind, body, soul, staring up at the sky, focusing your energy and the goodness of your heart into that area it takes a little bit, so mm -hmm. it may not happen the first time, may not happen the second or third, but if you keep doing that, eventually the contact will be made. That's true, and I get that question a lot from people who have never seen anything, and they're like, why does this person see something and this person doesn't? That's a real common question I get. Is there something different? I have some theories about that. I don't know, um, you know what causes some people to be able to see in what does it but pure intent exactly i think a you have to ask for it you need to intend it to happen you have to have a pure clear heart and mind just like you said um stay really grounded keep fear away so there's a whole there's a, a lot of different reasons um some people their brains are just wired so they're able to maybe peek into that other realm a little easier than others i agree with you I agree, I totally agree with you and and you know it's something that eventually as we grow more toward the consciousness level I think we're going to see that. Yeah. And everybody can learn to do it. So you know when I talk to folks that have trouble seeing or experience anything I just will talk to them and say okay well number 1 first step you need to intend it and ask for it and then we go through a whole list and it does take practice like anything else to um, kind of tap into that side of, of your spirituality or your being. And that's true for UFO and paranormal. I think all of it is connected. I would love to see more people do it. I used to be able to do it and I can't now. Why, why is that? I don't spend enough time outside. Mm. Like, it takes time. Like, you just can't spend five minutes outside, stare up at the stars and say, okay, uh, I'm, I'm good here and uh, show me, come on, aliens, show me where you are. It doesn't work that way. Right. It's true. You know, you definitely need to take the time and and make sure that, that you, you set the parameters around yourself. It's true. And protect yourself always. Like you don't want to, you got to be careful what you invite in. <laughs> to your Very story. true. Yeah. Very true. Put the intention out there on what aliens you want to be visiting. Because you don't want the bad guys. Oh, no bad. Last, White last, White. Thing, <laughs> last thing you want is to get Whitley without any lube. That's it. 
Katie Grabowski will be with us another half an hour. Then we're getting to the Magic 8 Ball on Spaced Out Radio next. All right, I'm just going to run my dogs outside one final time. I'll be right back, okay? (laughs) Be right back, people. All right, I am back. So I'm going to get you, uh, when we uh, get to the break at the bottom of the hour, just uh, stick with me right through the break, and then I'll say a proper good night to you. Okay. Yeah, that works for me. Hey, I had to go. <coughs> it's purology. I had to go look. I'll never forget that again. Purology. 
Pureology. Beautiful. <laughs> Pureology. It's the best. <laughs> That's what we're going with tonight. Pureology. <laughs> Right. Open up a whole can of, can of worms with calling the UFOs in. That's a that's a controversial subject. <laughs> it is, but you it's know what? Subject. It's a hard. It's hard to. But but you said something really cool there, and that was put the in, if you put the intention out of whom or what you want to connect with, the chances of having something really cool happen are very high. And you know how I noticed that in Ghost Hunters, I was I was always curious that um, Grant and Jason would always have things happen to them, and then Amy, Bruni, and um, Kristen, Chris didn't, and they were kind of more skeptics, right? And Jason and Grant were very open and almost were expecting things to happen all the time. And these are people I've met in person, and you know. I, I believe them. I know that they have to do some things for the show from time to time, but I really believe it. It was because of their intention. Like they were expecting things to happen. And so things did happen. Well, I think there was some behind the scenes that Jason won't admit that he's actually quite tuned in. Yeah, I think so. He, he, he just won't admit that for the sake because they're scientific, which they are not. Thank you, Ozzy, Steve, Fabster, Snakes, Jazz, and uh, Media Fox, Apollo, and Michael for the super chats. Really appreciate the love and support of this show. Here we go with hour three. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott at SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much. For taking the time to join us, we really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. This one scares me. Lectisterinium. I, I butchered that. Lectisterinium. There we go. Yeah, use it wisely, space travelers. As the clams, that's the password. Each and every night, right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, from Colorado, MUFON State Director Katie Grabowski is our guest tonight. And I'll tell you, this lady is on the hunt for anything extraterrestrial, supernatural. Her website, katiegrabowski.com, which I highly suggest you check on out. Katie, welcome back. Thanks, Dave. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. Audience question here from Tony. In what way exactly would one protect themselves whilst making, we don't use the word whilst around here enough, whilst making a CE5 type connection? Uh, definitely start by putting both feet on the ground, grounding yourself, picturing that white light of protection around you and making sure your intentions are for the good, pure heart, uh, and literally just say, you know, don't let anything bad into my circle. So, you know, and that's true for any type of work you do um, in, in this realm, so to speak. You really have to be careful with what you intend and what you want to let yourself experience. Gnome Squatch wants to know, does CE5 lead to abductions or probing? <laughs> Everybody that. likes a good anal probing, let's be honest. I suppose that it could. I think if you're opening the door and inviting them in, who knows? And, you know, again, that's why you need to be careful and protect yourself. So I suppose that it could lead to that, yes. Um, abductions, you know, that's that's a very fragile thing. And MUFON has the experience or team with Kathleen Martin. Um, and I talked to a lot of experiencers. Um, and it's not always some abductees, um, I would say, 
The majority of abductees say it's a positive experiences. I would say maybe 40, 45%, not so much. Um, it's really interesting too. I mean, alien contact and abductions also can change from time as, as when you're younger and you're a child or it, it can turn from a, a very frightening experience and change into, oh, a, a better one where maybe they feel protected or guided or put on some sort of mission or something or a purpose in their life. So it's interesting talking to different experiencers about whether it's, you know, positive or a negative experiences. You, you know what, though? I will say this from personal experience. I think when you open the door, there is that chance. As much as you protect yourself, I think you end up being like a Kmart blue light special with the beacon light over top of you. And every other species out there, whether they are positive or negative, now knows that you are a contactee or mm -hmm. trying to emit or create contact. And therefore, as much as you put out the good you are expected to get some bad or, or some not so nice as well. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to be having, you know, arms ripped off or or anything like that or all of a sudden become part of the hybridization program. But, you know, for people who've never experienced this, you know, and we get a lot of people on here who will say, look, I don't care if it's good or bad. I just want something to happen. Make me believe. Give me something that makes me believe. And we have to be prepared for that. So you can prepare for all of the good contact that you want, and you you got to put the energy out there for that. However, you really do need to realize that for all that good energy, there is something that is watching, waiting to pick up your signal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, there's always positive and negative and everything. Uh, I just saw a question that came through here too about, you know, uh, why do the ETs not want us to talk about them or why were we warned not to talk about them i i'm not so sure and this is something that i'm trying to answer i don't know if it was the ets that were warning us not to talk or if it was the military norad and the government that was warning us not to talk about what was going on if there was some sort of psychological experiment going out on out there at the time i mean number one this is why um a lot of the truth will never be disclosed um, can you imagine the lawsuits if we found out that they were running these psychological experiments on innocent people, you know, at the time? Um, so I just I just saw that come in and wanted to to address that. Um, so. Yeah, not a problem. Not a problem. With ET contact, with your role in MUFON, how do you decide what is true contact and whether it's something that will be contact or, or let me rephrase i apologize how do you know it's real contact and not just somebody who is having psychological problems good question uh, and that's something i'm very very sensitive to i had a half brother um, who had some mental issues uh, my my oldest half brother um, he was super intelligent, super artistic, and wrote some really profound poetry that almost sounded ET connected in a way. Um, so I'm very sensitive to mental illness in that. And um, for me personally, I think it's really important to just hear people out, listen to what they have to say, take the information down and be unbiased and unjudgmental. Uh, you know, take down the facts, take down their experiences um be be a sounding board for those people and i'll tell you my biggest inspiration for that is dr leo sprinkle and all his pioneering work he did with experiencers and that's exactly what dr leo was for so many people was a sounding board he he was a man that is just he's 90 and um, i think somebody earlier asked how he's doing he he is now um permanently in assisted living with his wife marilyn he just had his 90th birthday and he has had a few falls. Um, so, you know, he's getting a little frail up there, but he's otherwise doing pretty well. Um, and good old, you know, Leo is known to go yeehaw um, in, his, in his own little way. But he um, was so generous with his time. Like he, he would sit down on a couch with you and talk for you, talk with you for two hours and, and listen to your experiences. And, and, and he did it 
to really research and look at the data and look at the percentages and the commonalities. And I think that's really, really important. And, and I think, you know, whether somebody has a mental illness and is completely out there, I mean, you get a good sense of that within the first five or 10 minutes, but you still need to be open and to listen to what they say. Um, and then just make note of that, that possibly could be an underlying condition or um, cause. Do you believe then for, for the majority of people who create this type of scenario for themselves or experiencing extraterrestrial contact, do you believe that this is something that goes through a, a life cycle because we see a lot of patterns, you know, uh, going for generations? Or do you think that this is something that is hitting most people as they start to develop their own spirituality and looking for their own answers? I think it's the first thing you said. I think, well, for most, I think, I think it can happen both ways, but I think it's more common to kind of, I think I have seen time and time and again, and so as other researchers that these see, these tend to run in family lines um, and they seem to follow generational tracks. Um, and it seems like there's like, marks where like you have initial contact at maybe three years old, five years old, your teen years are really heightened from like 12 to 20. And then it kind of goes dormant for a while. And I don't know if that's because we get busy with our lives and family. And then there's a, something that will usually trigger an, a, another contact or awakening or a tap into your consciousness you know, later on in your years, let's say your late 30s or mid 40s, you know, in that range. So it, it kind of follows this pattern that I've seen anyway. Yeah, that that's kind of the big thing that I, I'm looking for too is is that is that connection because, like, I know in my family, nobody in my family has had experiences that they know of. That they know of, <laughs> right? Right. And I don't think they're the type of people who would actually admit it. Well, <laughs> you know, right. So with MUFON, you being a part of the specialized investigative teams, what's different between those teams and a regular investigation? Well, with MUFON, there is the field investigator, and then they have the STAR team, which is strike team response, and then they have the SAT team. Now, the SAT team has been dissolved, and the intention for that, it kind of caused a lot of, um, I wouldn't say turmoil, but um, people were like, well, why, why do you have this specialized SAT team? And the intention was good. The intention was to have people that had different specialties, you know, PhD, a scientist, a photo expert, a lab expert, you know, a researcher, which was kind of my role. And if they had a case that was sort of more sensitive or they they needed extra work, everybody would collaborate together, which is really how every case should be anyway. We should all collaborate always together. So that team's been dissolved because we didn't want to be, you know, anybody thinking, oh, they're taking the special good cases and we can't have access to those. And in the state of Colorado, even our star team members, you know, we have quite a few star team members. And that just means you've worked more cases, you have more experience. Um, but and in and move on, we have category ones, category two, and category three. Category three, of course, are your kind of top cases, are more close encounter, very um uh, abduction cases and whatnot that need attention right away. But we will give field investigators cat three cases or work with them. So in Colorado and within MUFON, we all try to collaborate and work cases together. So it's not like just certain people are taking the special cases and you, you don't get any of those. It's not like that at all. It's just that you have a little bit more experience so you can work with and train the new FIs coming in. So that's how we work it here. Over the last year, and, and and this will be a little bit, a little bit sensitive. But over the last year, Mufon has taken an absolute beating with everything that has gone on with with Jan Harzan and and 
that horrific case that's still before the courts and, you know, allegedly, because we have to use the word allegedly, you know, trying to lure teenage children who ended up being a police officer. Thank, thank goodness if that's the truth. All right. So my question to you is, do you think MUFON has done enough to bounce back from that stigma of people distrusting them or thinking that now uh, that there is pedophiles roaming around MUFON? Right. MUFON has got a pretty bad reputation from, I mean, it seems like every few years something else happens that kind of knocks MUFON back down into the dirt again, um, whether it's, you know, the racist remarks, or, you know, and the, the scandal with Jan Harazan. And it's, you know, it's been tough to kind of hold up MUFON. And I, I'm always just somebody who goes by my own experiences, especially being a female in the field. Um, there's been issues with, you know, rumors that, you know, women can't go very far there. But from my own experience, I've never experienced that. I've always, the Colorado MUFON family is very close. Um, it is like a second family to me. Um, and uh, I haven't experienced anything bad. I think what happened with Jan is awful. I don't think a whole organization needs to be, you know, thrown away because of somebody's really horrible judgment. I think there's a lot of great, great people and field investigators within the organization still. Um, your question on whether they can do more to kind of battle all this, I think they could probably do a little bit more, but I think we're doing the best we can to kind of slowly work our way back in there and taking steps to kind of mend mend things the best way we can. So as a as a state director regarding this entire situation, has the board of governors reached out to the state directors to keep you in touch and abreast with what's going on? Not so much, no. Not when it comes to um Jan. Um it's sort of, you know, Let's forget about that and move on. Um, and that sort of been that's always been their mantra, though. Yeah, it kind of has been. And, and I and I've talked to uh, Tom Whitmore about this, and you know, I think that Mufon over the last couple of years, never mind the whole Jan Harzan thing, I think they've dropped the ball. A little bit, yes. You're supposed to be the big dog on campus, and you're not in the media when the media is striking out to everybody about UFOs. You're still not in the media post Jan Harzan. You're 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 sitting there like a, a lame duck, and you're supposed to be the big dog on campus, and you're playing catch up. Mm -hmm. And for me, I find that very frustrating because I like Mufon. Yeah, you yeah, know, it's frustrating as well. And I've done a couple local things here, um, but again, um, I you know I think there's work to be done there, and it is a little bit frustrating. And I wish we can get you know more out front. And, and centered and um so you know i'm hanging in there um and hoping it'll will turn around and we'll get back up on the horse again i hope i think it as i've said uh publicly i think it needs a major change up top not all the board of directors got to go but it mm -hmm. needs a good house cleaning and I think that starts with the members who are paying money for it to start raising a little bit of hell to make that happen because MUFON has too much on the go that they've dropped the ball too much and they need some fresh, innovative ideas to get back on top. There's no reason why the U.S. government uh, should have uh, not be talking to MUFON about their files. Mm -hmm. Okay, MUFON shouldn't be selling files. Right. They shouldn't be doing a lot of the stuff that they're doing. I mean, right. you think about it. You, I mean, this this is a, a, a supreme point that I would love to make about MUFON. Here is a prime example of them dropping the ball. When the DNI report came out, MUFON should have had an immediate, they've got a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. They should have had an immediate YouTube conference breaking down that report or submitting a press release to every major news outlet saying, here we are, ready to talk, let's discuss this, about how this either is A, good, or B, not so good for the field of UFOs. Absolutely. And, no, and nobody is doing that. Yeah, absolutely. I did our local news channel here in Colorado 
Um, but I, I, and I, and I did, I had to make it clear that this is my personal opinion and not the um, position of MUFON. And um, cause I cannot speak for MUFON. Um, so I, you know, I was hopeful MUFON would have done that and may, they may have, and I'm just not aware of it. So communication is a big part. And I think we can maybe do a little bit better there. But like I said, there's so many great people in MUFON and I've had nothing but great experiences with MUFON and I'm looking forward to the symposium. So I'm hopefully I can be one of those fighters in there pushing for the change and pushing to come back um, from the dead, so to speak, a little bit, because you're right. You know, we've been around for a long time and there's been a lot of work. And I'm just like you, Dave, uh, I don't ever think we should charge people for research or to um, access our old files and that. And um, that's a sticking point. And I'm not sure what they're doing with that. Um, they're working on a whole new program and I'm hoping it's gonna be a, a really good positive program. My last thing I will say about MUFON, and I apologize if I put you on the spot here it's with okay. this. I, I love MUFON. <laughs> okay. uh, well, and, and trust me, I, I wanna go on record and say, I'm a fan too. But for all the negative people out there who have a bad taste in their mouth about MUFON, whether it's John Ventry's racist comments, whether it's Jan Harzan and the alleged charges he is on, on right now, we have to draw a very, very thick felt pen line between the investigators who are out there doing this for the love of the subject, for the love of trying to find out those answers for people, and the business side of MUFON, which seems to be out of control or not in control of anything that they are doing right now. And I think that too many people get get the MUFON name mixed up with everybody in the organization rather than understanding there's MUFON, the investigative side. Then there's MUFON, the board of directors who use that for the business side and as long as we could draw the line there, because I know a lot of people in MUFON and even members of the board of directors who I highly respect, like Tom Whitmore, mm -hmm. okay, who I would drive through a brick wall for. We do have to remember, though, that there are good people there and, and they may not, even though they're waving the MUFON flag, they may not be supporting what is actually going on in those closed door meetings, especially the the state directors like yourself or the other members of MUFON who are field investigators. I think that's a fair comment. I think that's absolutely fair. And a lot of times even the state directors really don't know what goes on behind closed doors. Um, and now is a real busy time too with the symposium and COVID. And it's been a kind of a funny time just even within Colorado MUFON having everything on Zoom and feeling that disconnect. So the whole COVID, just like everybody else in the world, it's hit the organization kind of hard too. And just the local chapters, not being able to meet and get together and all that stuff. And another rumor that some people believe like you get paid to be a field investigator or you're paid with a MUFON, but it's all voluntary. And the majority of people in the organization are there just because they're truly interested in the phenomenon. And like any other club or organization or group, you know, with your local groups, you, you meet like-minded people and it's a place to go collaborate and talk and, you know, research and all that. So, you know, overall for me, it's been a really great experience. Um, but I agree with you, Dave, definitely we have mending fences and a, a lot of improvements and a lot of growth that we can do. We need to get a lot of uh, young, young new blood in there to, to kind of, you know, freshen things up a little bit, fluff our fluff the pillows and <laughs> I, I will tell you one thing and I've told Tom Whitmore this I would I would love to run MUFON right. I know I know the exact game plan that I would use and I mean you get paid to talk UFOs I mean and deal with UFOs I mm -hmm. mean that is a dream job for somebody like me Mm -hmm. And I think it, there needs to be some new blood, some new mandate, but that's enough of that. We've got about 20 seconds left. Tell everybody where they can find your information. Uh, it's just my name, Katie, K-A-T-I-E-G-R-I-B as in boy, O-S-K-I.com, katiegorboski.com. You can find my contact information there and a little bit more about me and the book, Letters of Love and Light is on Amazon. 
Rock and roll. Katie Grabowski, we're definitely going to bring you back on Spaced Out Radio some other time. But for now, we have to say goodnight to you, katiegrabowski.com. Coming up next, I'm warming up the Magic 8 Ball. You get your questions ready. Let's get psychic right after this. Katie Grabowski, everybody. Katie Grabowski. Great show. Great show. See, that was a lot of fun. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I can take these off for a second. Oh. <laughs> I got a lot of hair gel in to hold it in place. Love it. Katie, thank you so much for coming on the show. I had, and just reading my audience, my audience absolutely loved you. And we had well over 200 people watching each hour. So uh, congratulations on that. And uh, thank you so much for being just a, a real beautiful, bright star in the sky of UFOs. I appreciate you. Well, thank you, Dave. I appreciate you having me on. And Let, let's do it again. Okay, absolutely. You know, I, I'm i constantly researching, I'm constantly digging, and I hopefully we'll have more and more to talk about as things go on, you know? Well, if you, get, if you break that story, I want you to break that story here. <laughs> because uh, we're the only ones who will able, be able to do it uh, with journalistic integrity. Awesome. All right. Yeah. That's, that's my cocky side coming out right there. <laughs> A little bit more work to do, but when when it breaks, I you know I'm hoping it will in the next year or so. Awesome. You take care. Enjoy yeah. your night. Thank you for staying up late, you. and uh, thank you for uh, being an absolutely incredible interview. Awesome. Thank you, Dave. I hope Canada opens up soon so you can get out here and make it to a symposium. Oh, that is the goal. Yeah. By God, that is the goal. Oh, and uh, Alan makes a good point. Thanks for having great hair. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> All right. Take care, Katie. All right. Thanks. Night. Good night. All right. Katie Grabowski, everybody. How awesome is she? How awesome was she? Space Cow, you suck. Oilers are, don't suck, even though we have a terrible goaltender. How do you re-sign Mike Smith for two years? The guy is like 56 years old. <clears throat> That was good radio tonight, guys. Good radio. Anya, thank you so much for the super chat. Ozzy, Steve, thank you for the pair of super chats. Fabster, Snakes, Jazz, Media Fox, Apollo, and Michael, thank you for the love and support through the super chat tonight. Really do appreciate that. Uh, in a few minutes here, once we uh, start introducing the final half hour, please put your questions in capital letters. I am warming up. The Magic 8 Ball. So stick around. I know uh, our numbers are starting to drop here because Katie's gone and they're like, uh, we don't want to hear from Fat Dave anymore. No, I know. I know, people, but we still got half an hour of a show. Look at that. We've dropped like 14 people here in the last like 38 seconds. Stick around. Ask the Magic 8 Ball a question. You know? That's it. That's all you got to do. Stick around. Oob to Joe's Bane. You've got aliens. Hi, Bombshell Bomber. I can finally see your comment. And you're leaving. Whoa. Did anybody just see that orb? That What the hell is that? Is that a moth? It's not an orb. It's a moth. It's a moth. I hate moths. Son of a bitch, I hate moths. Behoff, what's happening? To moth to a flame. My wings... Burn away, you bastard. Where? Stay the hell out of the camera, you jerk. Thank you. <sighs> 
Seriously, another one? Got you, you jerk. Hold on. Got to get rid of this one. And the other one. Got them both. They're gone. They got expelled from the studio. All right. All right. Here we go. We've rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are in this beautiful planet we call Earth. We want to say that you can check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Let's get to our fun night of the night. Fun night of the night? Fun part of the show tonight. Let's try some proper English there, Dave. It's Magic 8 Ball time. All right, it is time for the Magic 8 Ball tonight where we're going to ask questions from our audience and we're going to ask the psychic Magic 8 Ball to come on in as we do every week at this time to come on in and answer a few questions regarding anything supernatural. Do me a favor, put your questions in capital letters if you're in our chat room or on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio, and we're going to get to it. First question is going to come from Lazarus. Lazarus, will I be successful in my new endeavors? Magic 8 Ball never lies, may play some tricks. we got to go into Deep, deep thought about these answers here. Lazarus, will I be successful in my new endeavors? Magic 8 Ball says, let's see here. Intel looks good. Oh, we're ready tonight. Magic 8 Ball's on the ball. Keep doing what you're doing, Lazarus. Lazarus. And the Magic 8 Ball says, it looks good. So let's figure it out. All right. Oh, controversial question from Major Lee here. Will Travis Walton come clean about his hoax? I don't think he's hoaxing. I really don't. I think there's somebody trying to get some press. It all starts with Mike Rogers, his former brother-in-law who was driving the truck. And I'm telling you, I uh, Major Lee, I love you, but I'm going to disagree with you. Going to disagree. Let's see what the Magic 8 Ball says, because one of us is going to be wrong. All right? One of us is going to be wrong. Here we go. Magic 8 Ball says, you may rely on it. Ooh, maybe Travis Walton is telling some lies. Maybe. I don't think so. I'm disagreeing with the Magic 8 Ball here, Lee. I really am but I could be wrong. I don't think 45 years of throwing your name into the UFO crowd is something that you really want to do. But been wrong. Adam is asking, will anyone's beard ever compare to his? 
Now I want to see this beard. And Adam, if you ever decide to shave it, we do have a beard collection here in the studio. One of the gross things we do around here. Adam, your answer is Intel looks good. Intel looks good that your beard is undeniably better than anyone here right now. But we are going to need a photograph in order to check this out. We really are. So we can't, we're going by the guess of the Magic 8 Ball. We are not going by physical proof of a photograph to prove whether or not the beard fits, so you must acquit. Just saying. All right. Let's move on here. Sandra is asking, will little SOR be an accomplished guitarist? So she's asking about my son, who's a little metalhead. God bless him for that. I call that good parenting on my part. Okay. You know how I punish my son when he's been bad? I threaten to take him to the soccer field. I said, you don't want to be one of them, son. You don't want to be one of them. You're going to be bad. You're going to listen to country music. Take him to the soccer field. All right. Will my son become an accomplished guitarist? Out of fuel, try again later. So what that really means, Sandra, is this. The boy is only eight years old, so we can't push him into anything. All right? Can't force that. He's going to find his own destiny, and maybe, maybe he will. Maybe he won't. But you know what? As long as he has fun playing, that's all that matters. Because I'm telling you right now, it is really cool learning how to rock with my kid. It really is cool learning how to rock with my kid. I'm not going to lie. All right. Let's continue on here with the Magic 8 Ball. Uh, let's see. Uh, thank you, Amy Vegas O, for saying there's nothing wrong with the shirt I'm wearing tonight. Appreciate that. All right. Um, let's go to Double Tim. Were those moths the first of your Studio 7 plagues? Well, I've been getting, Tim, I've been getting a lot of moths right now because I don't have a screen on my window. Okay, that's part of the issue. And it gets really warm in here with all the, inside the studio with all the equipment going on. So, and I do have a fan in here that keeps me nice and cool, but I do like to have the window open because I like the fresh air. And is this a plague? You have my pity. Apparently, I am hit by a plague as we see the humor of the Magic 8 Ball agreeing with Tim on that my studio is being hit by a plague of moths. D. Swiger is asking, will I be moving within the year? Nice, honest question here. Magic 8 Ball says, ask again later because not right now. I don't see it happening right now. And apparently the Magic 8 Ball doesn't agree with that right now either. So maybe I would ask in a few months. Again, D, because we might be getting a little bit closer. Greco asks a power question here. Will Dave finish his book within the next 10 years? Magic 8-Ball says, don't count on it. Thanks, Magic 8-Ball. That means I'm going to have writer's block for the next decade. I should get it out before then. I really should. Michelle is asking... Will Australia ever be liberated from being a penal colony so we could go to Vegas with Dave? Well, you're a bunch of crooks over there. Let's just be honest. You're all relatives of, of bad, bad people. But you're good people. You Aussies are good, even though every animal on your continent wants to kill you, even those in the water. Is Michelle C. coming to Vegas? Out of fuel, try later. And I understand this answer from the Magic 8 Ball because we don't know what the hell's happening with the border up here. So that way, us here in Canada can't get down to the United States right now so we could have our spaced out radio party. Michelle, I'm going to tell you this, though. With great positivity, let's, let's rephrase that question. Should Michelle start saving up to fly from Australia to Las Vegas for the SOR party? 
Is it time for her to start saving up money? Magic 8-Ball, come on. It is decidedly so. It is decidedly so. So, Michelle, if you want to come to the Vegas party, it's time to start putting a few bucks away every two weeks when you get paid. All right? Just saying. Let's get to another question here. Uh, Dave doesn't have bunny slippers, so I can't uh, make ask that question. 11. The light in the corner of my living room keeps going out and coming back on. Is there a ghost in here? No. In hypersleep. No ghost. It's called electricity and a bulb that has a problem with it. Yeah. You might want to change your bulb on that one. All right. Space Cow, Magic 8 Ball, will I find a hot-looking woman this year? All clear, which means there's a good possibility that you are going to be taken off the singles list. My gut feeling, aim for October, November. All right? Try and get through Christmas so at least you get some Christmas presents. All right, let's go to Greco. Does Dave wear his assless chaps to increase his ET abduction rate? The answer is, you have my pity, Greco. In other words, the, you just got eye-rolled by the Magic 8-Ball for that one. All right? You just got eye-rolled. Kind of like, really? Really? Hey, can't make this stuff up. B. Hoff is asking, Magic 8 Ball, am I being monitored? Well, every day on the internet you are. If you're on Facebook, definitely, or Instagram. Don't count on it. You don't got aliens monitoring you. Sorry, Magic 8 Ball is just, it was quite trite on that one. Don't count on it. What a jerk kind of answer. Who does that? 509 is asking, will West Coast USA be where first contact of aliens happen? From 509, uh, the answer is out of fuel, try again later, which means no, it's not happening on the West Coast. Mama Susan is asking, will the shots I got today help with the pain? Magic 8 Ball says, Signs point to yes, Mama Susan. You're going to start feeling good pretty soon. All right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Fap, by the way, says soccer is the ultimate threat to hold over your child. I'd rather do 24 hours of math than that. Me too, Fap. Me too. All right. Apollo 11 wants to know, does Dave's little gnome statue... If you catch us on YouTube, you'll see that I have a gnome over my right shoulder. Does it move around on its own? Don't count on it. Nope. Doesn't move on its own. Love that gnome. Love that gnome. All right. Gnome Squatch is asking, I just tried CE5. Should I wear underpants tonight? Ask again later. Maybe the aliens don't want you to wear underpants. Gnome Squatch? No, I don't think they do. George is asking, will ETs ever make themselves known to all humanity? Sensors read no. I think the ball got that one wrong. I really do. I really think the eight ball got that one wrong. I don't agree with that answer at all. D. Swiger, do aliens really steal coffee? Sensors read no. It's probably your cat. David Mitchell, eight ball, was what I saw on Saturday night a real UFO? The answer is, you may rely on it. 
Let us know in the chat room what you saw. All right. Greco, are the Toronto Maple Leafs winning the Stanley Cup in other dimensions or realities? I'm shaking this, and I guarantee the answer is going to be no. I'm like 100% correct. If I'm wrong, I'll admit it. But no. You got to realize, God hates the Maple Leafs. All right? God hates the Maple Leafs, and we thank God for that. As I see it, yes. Damn it. Apparently, in other dimensions, the Leafs have won the Stanley Cup, just not on our timeline right now. All right. Let's see if we got any more here. Let's see. I don't think so. We're not getting political. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Do we have any more? Sandra, do aliens wear hoodies? Infinitely, yes. It's a nice camouflage. You know? So basically, what they, they they're, what they're trying to do is they're trying to, they're like FAP. They're trying to hide the size of the head that they have in the hood. Beverly, will we make it a year's end without major upsets? Out of fuel, try again later. Don't know. Mm, not asking that, PBR. And I think we, uh, we're going to, um, no, we're going to call it the night on this one. All right, because I can feel the Magic 8 ball starting to lose some of its steam. And anyways... Captain Shirk will kick my butt if I don't get to the news. The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire at the back end of every show where we get to the weird, the strange, the wacky, and sometimes the absolute odd. The Lumberjack is a ride in Toronto, all right, at Canada's Wonderland theme park, all right? And it's one of these rides that you go on and it kind of rotates. It looks like a couple of axes. People sit on the outside and it goes upside down. Well, anyways, the ride got stuck with the people upside down for like five minutes. Yeah, it opened in 2018, consists of two swinging axe pendulums, gives riders the sensation of an inverted coaster loop, according to Wonderland's website. But what makes it even more thrilling is that the riders face guests on the other side as they loop around and around. So seeing the horror and in increasingly red faces as they were stuck upside down wasn't fun. Yep, just happens. I, I wouldn't mind that. I'll be honest with you. Wouldn't bother me what so bit matter. I got stuck on a chairlift once at Mount Baker in Washington. Chairlift broke down for like two hours, and I was stuck at the highest point. All right, the highest point. Like people, other, other people could have just jumped off and went in the powder. Not old Davy. Davy gets stuck on the highest point. All right, I was able to take it. Not a problem. Not. A, I just sat there and relaxed. A new project seeks to uncover evidence of aliens, not by gazing upon distant star systems, but by finding traces of their technologies inside our solar system and even Earth. Yep. Let's do this thing, right? So how's this going to happen? It's called the Galileo Project. Avi Loeb is setting it up. We just interviewed him with Lynn Wallington just the other night. You can find that on our archives where he's talking about this. He has announced a goal, a Galileo project that is, has announced its goal of searching for signs of extraterrestrial and technological signatures. But instead of hunting for alien radio frequencies or messages encoded in laser light, as other projects have done, these researchers will be searching for physical objects located nearby. These objects could take form of a passing probe, a small object in orbit around Earth, or United or United unidentified aerial phenomena. Astronomer Avi Loeb from Harvard is the co-founder of the Galileo Project. 
named in honor of the unfairly maligned 17th century Italian astronomer. You may already be familiar with Avi Loeb because of Oumuamua and appearing on Spaced Out Radio a couple nights ago. And he wants to be able to bring this. He believes the aliens are here. Now we got to go out and find them. So let's go find them. We need to find some aliens. Finally tonight, very cool story. I'm so glad Captain Shirk brought this to my attention because I love stuff like this. French dad and robotics engineer Jean-Louis Costanza has built a robotic suit for his 16-year-old son, Oscar, that allows him to walk. Oscar, a wheelchair user, activates the suit by saying, Robot, stand up, and then it walks for him. Jean-Louis co-founded the company that builds the suit, which can allow users to move upright for a few hours a day. It is used in hospitals in several countries, but isn't available yet for everyday use by individuals. It has a hefty price tag of about $200,000 U.S., Personal exoskeleton would need to be much lighter, the company's engineer said, but they are working on it. That's what I would love to see, is more people who are paralyzed being able to have the sensation of walking again. Fun of the day happens every night at this time where we ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages. Then read your responses on the air because we love the audience participation around here. Today's thought of the day is as follows. What would you like to experience with extraterrestrials? Josh, nothing at all, ever. Eugene, the truth, who they really are, and their true agenda. Double Bobby, all-you-can-eat buffet with R. Keith Andrews. Cat the Kit, hyperdimensional space folding. Darren, it's not good to ask, as I found out. Tim, tooling around the galaxy. Lori, where they are from, and what does the Milky Way look like from space? Will. An anal probe, Streber style. Magnus, alien drugs. Now, I mean for real, though. I'd enjoy knowing the real history of our planet. If they could show me that, that'd be awesome. Danny, what is their interest involvement with us? Kevin, Dave, I would like to experience some of the extraterrestrial healing, knowledge transfers, and over life-changing experiences that would help me have the strength, conviction, and gifts to bring peace, spiritual growth, and prosperity to everyone here. Thank you for everybody participating in the thought of the day. Thank you to Captain Shirk for the news, the SOR Newswire, everyone playing along on the eight ball, and of course, to Katie Grabowski as being our guest. We got Mr. Ron Bubblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brothers watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms, YouTube, LGAB, Twitch, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us, because together, my friends... We own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. That was a fun show, people. Fun show. Good job out there. You guys made that happen. You guys made a good show happen tonight. You really did.
Woohoo! <sighs> that was fun. Fun, fun show. Tomorrow night on the show, we're going to be talking holographic earth and everything holographic. Andrew Saparito will be our guest. Andrew Saparito. Find out what he's all about. Good news is I can take my headphones off. See my haircut? See how tight that is on the sides? That's a one. Uh, I might, Jessica. I might do another hypnosis session. Why not? You mean, are you talking about the hypnosis or my hair? I don't have any hair ties down here. Do I? No. No, I don't. Took it upstairs. Damn it. Oh, my hair is much cooler. Uh, would Dave ever dye his hair uh, a fun color? Yep, Dave would. Totally. Probably not. I'm just brave to say that I would. Kevin, you look fabulous. D Swagger, not hollow pornographic. No. By the time I speak in February in San Francisco, my hair will be back down to about here. That'll be really cool. Am I keeping up uh, with UAP expeditions? Um, yes and no. I got to talk to the guys there just to kind of get an update. I do know that they are in production right now, so the guys are not going to talk publicly about it. They have NDAs for it. Fap, you really hate this shirt, eh? I would give you $250 Canadian and deliver it in person if you dye your hair green. Dude, I need way more than $250 in order to dye my hair green. That's getting into four figures. Getting into four figures. I'm just saying. Do I do NDAs? Um, no. Uh, Lee is loving SOR weekends wonderfully. Lynn is amazing. Thousand bucks. All right, give me two seconds here, guys.
Uh, who would I sign an NDA with? Uh, I have only ever signed uh, two NDAs. Uh, one was for a Discovery Channel show I was on a couple years ago. And the other one was for uh, a television show I thought was going to happen, but didn't happen. And that's usually the way they go because they want you to sign NDA agreements before you uh, sign on. They don't want people giving out the secrets. Hold on, let me check this here for a quick second. Is that start? All right, cool. They don't want people giving out the information of the show beforehand, so they hold you to that NDA. Now, Dave's not playing Tetris. I'll show you what Dave is doing. Hold on. <sighs> right here, Dave's editing the show. There you go. That's what old Dave is doing. I dye my beard for conferences. I go darker with my beard. I have no problem doing that. I admit that. I color my beard. I put in the just for men stuff. It works pretty cool. Uh, what I, I'm not editing out, I'm editing, well, I am actually editing out the breaks from uh, the show. So, for instance, we go to commercial break on the radio show. That's where I have to cut the audio. Fabster, if we painted you green, you'd look like Kazoo from the Flintstones with a giant melon on your head. You wouldn't even need a helmet for it. People would just naturally assume. In fact, I just made your Halloween costume for this year. Green tights and paint your head green. That is brilliant. Sometimes I am on the ball. Hey, Grand Paul Holland, I heard you have some amazing stories <coughs> of high strangeness. Are you going to confirm this with me? Oh, Grandpa Holland, uh, I saw a link to a Cobalt Blue Les Paul standard. Here, I'll show you. Uh, hold on. Oh, hold on. Now. Let's go like this. Let's go like this. Like this. Let's go like this. Uh, let's go here. Let's go to Marketplace. Uh Oh, where is it here? Where is it here? Oh, that's new. What is that one? I don't like that base. Oh, that that's... Is that even Gibson? Oh, it is. That is nice.
2007. Anyways, it's not the one I want. Where are you? Where are you, you little bitch? I was looking at this one, but that's a studio. I was looking at this one. Is a studio worth it? Because I have to watch out what, what I can afford. This guy wants like 1300 bucks for this. And that's still way out of my price range. Or where are you? What is Gritty Customs? What is this? I've never seen this. Oh, that looks cheap. That looks real cheap. No, let's just get rid of that. Where are you? You were on here earlier because I was looking at you. Don't tell me it's sold and they took it down. I will be heartbroken if that's the case. We're getting closer. I was looking at this one too, Paul Holland. I really like that silver. <clears throat> it's a little nick right there though. Well, it's got two nicks on it. Yeah, that's the other nick. That just kills me. So stay away from the studios. Is that what you're saying? Those are built in China. I definitely want a North American version. Where are you? Why am I missing it all of a sudden? Wasn't this far down before? I think I'm getting warmer. Seriously, where the hell did it go? I bet you the guy sold it. Son of a gun. I was going to show this to you last night, too. It was a standard. That's nice. That's nice. I like that. That is very nice. I don't want Paul's. He loves that guitar. I would take it. Here's a nice one for you, Paul Holland. Check this one out. 4600 bucks Canadian. That would look good in your collection right there. I'm just saying. That would look good in your in your collection right there. Caribbean blue. Look how nice that is. Hey, Detailing Academy, how you doing? Do you want the link for that one, Paul Holland? I can send you the link. It's in Vancouver. Oh, 
I'll send you the link. All right, let me go to Paul Holland here. Whether you do anything with it or not, that's up to you. But this would be gorgeous for you. There, sent you the link. What's that one? Looks like an Ibanez or a Dean. That's a Dean. Oh, that's so nice. And I'm thinking the blue one must have sold because it is not on here anymore. <clears throat> it was earlier today. So the guy must have pulled it off. See, that would be nice if it wasn't an Epiphone. I like that paint scheme. But Epiphones are also made in China. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but when it comes to Gibsons, there's a lot wrong with that. Yeah, I think it's it must have sold. Seriously must have sold. Maybe I'll get something like that. Little BC Rich action right there. God, that's actually kind of sexy. Dirty. Guy hasn't cleaned it properly. That is actually kind of a sexy guitar. Eight hundred bucks. Anyways, I got to get back to editing. Sent you that link, Paul Holland, just in case you get excited. All right, where am I here? All right, so I got to do number four here. Let's go like this. Before I get too ahead of myself. I'd actually like to see you pick that guitar up, Paul Holland. That is a gorgeous guitar. No, no, don't ship it to Dave. Dave will get his own cobalt. I've held one. Held one at the guitar store in Kamloops. I'm in love with that cobalt guitar. I'm not going to lie. When the time is right, I will get it. First things first, though, I want to get my son a, uh, a Gibson's. <clears throat> that way, because right now he's playing on uh, my LTD that I have. It's not a bad guitar, but it's not a good guitar. So I'll invest in my son way, way before I'll invest in me. <sighs> OK. 
Come on, let's save that. You know what, Kev? You're absolutely right. I am so not guitar poor, but the one thing that I have learned over the last few months, just taking the 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 um, guitar lessons that I have, is you can sure tell the difference in sound once your ears tune into it, and it doesn't take long. There's a sure difference in sound between a cheaply made guitar and an expensive guitar. It's definitely something where uh, quantity or quality, uh, you pay for your quality. That's for sure. And I never knew that until, until like, couple months ago. But now that I'm so, kind of gaining a, a slight ear for the sound, um, I could honestly say I agree with that. Well, that's like the same guitar, Paul Holland, <clears throat> except white. I want to hang out with your friends. All right, so that goes there. Let's open up this one now. Convert these bad boys. Michael Yan, ready to kill some fucking aliens there. I'm in, I'm in the military as a United, U.S. Marine infantryman. Congratulations on that, bro. Thank you for your service. Says, I will do free investigations to hunt these aliens and UFOs with my gun and AR-15 weapon platforms. That is seriously kick-ass. Problem is, you got to find a Bigfoot first, Michael. You know what? I saw an incredible video of a Sasquatch from a military helicopter. Somewhere in the uh, southeastern United States. That's all I know. Michael Yan, where are you stationed, man? Very cool. 
Very cool. Being a Marine is just so badass. It really is. I don't think I would have the balls to be a Marine. I swear they feed you raw meat just to toughen you guys up. Make you mean. I'll be right back, guys. I just got to hit the bathroom.
All right, I'm back. I'm taking my time tonight. Let's go like this, like that, like that, bring that back up, move that. Give me two seconds here, guys. So I gotta transfer these off. And give that a second. Fresh that. Not that yet. Oh well, we'll wait. And Hey, Sith Lord Jeff Bledsoe. How's it going? Welcome to our chat room. I can't believe there's still 125 of you hanging out here. I always wonder how many of you of that 125 have fallen asleep. <clears throat> That's what make kind of makes me wonder. Just for the week. That's right, Howard. Carbine's right. What's happening? Turn that off. <laughs> Excuse me. Right? You follow just you gotta write wakes up. Huh? What? Huh? You know what I always wonder? I, and I and I say this every so often. I always uh wonder out of because you guys get to change your names and you guys could be whoever you want, whatever you want. And, um, and I find that very cool and interesting. Um, especially some of the creative names you kind of guys come up with. I always wonder, you know, is there any famous people who listen to our show? Green hair. Yeah. Green hair. <laughs> uh, I always wonder if there is any famous people listening in like movie stars, athletes, rock stars, television stars, big name people. I, and, and you know, it's, uh, 
uh, it's it always baffles me, and and not like I, I would ever expect anybody to come out and hit me up on Facebook or Twitter and say, Psst, "By the way, I'm so and so." You know, I always wonder about that. I bet you there have been famous people listening in. I, uh, like the only famous person that I know that is really listening to the show is Bumblefoot because he's told me. But I mean, anything else like, like just like, I don't know. I think, I think it'd be, uh, I think it'd be really cool to, to, I, I think it's one of those really cool things we get to wonder about, you know, because let's face it, athletes, movie stars, rock stars, whatever they're famous for, they, they're people too. They have the same interests as us. A lot of them, maybe their own experiences. And maybe they've joined the chat room and it's a name that we would know. But they want to hide because, you know, if they came in with their name that we all know, uh, we wouldn't, you know, they couldn't have that privacy and that anonymity to say what they want, how they want about their experiences. I always wonder that. I also wonder how many spooks are in our chat room. If there is any or not. I really don't know. Close that off. Yeah, we'll go here. Give me two seconds here, guys. <clears throat> I seriously wonder about that. Could be Ace Freely, I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know. It's just one of those things I wonder about. Yeah, John, we're going to have to stay in touch with her regarding that case.
Tomorrow night on the show, we have Andrew Saparito. We're going to talk about holographic Earth, holographic Moon, everything holographic. Then John Hudson will join us for the UFO report. Stetson John. John, by the way, is getting a lot of good feedback about this segment. We're into week number two of the segment now. Doing an absolute great job, John. <coughs> Excuse me. You really are. All right. I'm going to call it the night here. Thank you to Anya, Ozzy Steve times two, Fapster, Snakes, Jazz, Media Fox, Apollo, and Michael for the awesome super chats. Really appreciate the love and support of Spaced Out Radio. And hello, Electro, Electro DJ. How are you, man, on Twitter? Good to see you. And uh, tomorrow night, Holographic Earth. Is it real? Is it fake? Is it Memorex? Is it 8-track? I don't know. We're going to find out tomorrow from our guest. And thank you to all the veterans out there who are uh, out there listening. We absolutely love you and appreciate you tuning us on in. You always have a home here on Spaced Out Radio. Thank you to all our regulars in the chat room tonight. We really appreciate you. And thank you for sharing the show, doing everything that you guys do to make us look good each and every night. Have a great night. Get some sleep. And uh, we'll see you all tomorrow night. Take care.